Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Next up on our agenda, Senate File 2251, Senator Uma Verbaten is going to step in on behalf of Senator Kunish today to present the bill. Um, the first two testifiers in connection with this can come on forward also and take the uh, chairs next to the senator. Whenever you're ready, Senator Uma Verbaten, describe the bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will try to be brief. We have um, some expert testifiers here who can go in more detail and uh, happy to carry this uh, uh, for Senator Kunish, who's unable to be here with us today. But in 2019, um, the Prairie Island community asked for this same sort of legislation just in order to be self-governing. Um, and the legislature, um, you know, allowed for that at that time. But really, it's important for all of our sovereign nations to be self-governing. This bill provides that uh, tribal law enforcement agencies are not uh, required to enter cooperative agreements with the local sheriff as a condition of exercising their concurrent jurisdiction within the boundaries of their reservations. And I'll just note that, you know, tribal police officers are fully licensed police officers, just like any other police officer in Minnesota. Um, hopefully everyone participated in Sovereignty Day on Monday where we were able to learn more about um, you know, some very important issues for our sovereign nations here in Minnesota. I participated in the public safety breakout that day, and this came up as one of the top priorities. So I'm um, honored to be a co-author of this legislation and to um, present it to you all today, and I'll let the testifiers provide some more detail. Thank you, uh, Senator Umu Verbaten. Uh, I'll call up the first two testifiers on my list, uh, James West, uh, Chief West. And uh, Solicitor General Caleb Dog Eagle, why don't you come on forward? Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to ask is uh, that you keep your uh, testimony brief, and uh, we know you're available to answer questions if there are any. So if there's any additional detail needed, we'll find that out. Uh, so uh, who's going to go first here, Chief West? I'll go first. All right, go ahead, sir. Introduce yourself and, and give us your testimony. Thank you, Chair and members of uh, the committee. Uh, my name is Caleb Dog Eagle. I'm the Solicitor General for the Mille Lacs Band. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to provide the brief testimony uh, in support <coughs> uh, of SF 2251. Uh, in, in the 1950s, Public Law 280 transferred uh, federal criminal jurisdiction on most Indian reservations in Minnesota to the state. In 1991, the Mille Lacs Band uh, worked on a bill that became law, Minnesota Statute Section 626.90. It was the first law on a Public Law 280 Minnesota reservation that provided that an Indian tribe could appoint peace officers and exercise state law enforcement authority. Under the law, uh, the peace officers appointed by the band had to be post board certified and were paid by the band. They had to waive immunity and agree to be responsible for torts committed by its officers and to purchase insurance for them. The officers would still refer suspects accused of violating state law to the county attorney for prosecution. <clears throat> 62690 states that the ban shall, shall enter into a cooperative law enforcement agreement with the county sheriff. The first such agreement was entered into uh, in 1991, shortly after the law was passed, with one brief interruption in 2008. The law and this agreement worked well for uh, the next 25 years. Uh, the tribal and uh, county police work side by side. However, the cooperative agreement requirement is an affront to tribal sovereignty and has long outlived its usefulness. Although tribal police departments were in their infancy back in 1991, uh, they've evolved over the past 30 years into sophisticated, highly trained, and well-funded law enforcement agencies. Many law enforcement agencies, including city police departments, county sheriffs, state patrol, and other state law enforcement agencies, and federal law enforcement agencies, uh, commonly exercise concurrent jurisdiction with no requirement that they enter into cooperative agreements. There's no reason to treat tribal police departments differently. The cooperative agreement <clears throat> requirement is not only unnecessary, and as I said before, is an affront to tribal sovereignty, it's subject to abuse, as you will hear from uh, Chief of Police James West in a moment. I just want to quickly highlight a few things about the bill, um, that it, it doesn't change any uh, jurisdiction of any state agency, 
It's not going to change the band's jurisdiction. It doesn't change the police officer's jurisdiction or their oversight. State law violations will continue to be submitted to the county attorney who has prosecutorial authority. What the bill does is it strengthens the tribe's ability to regulate its own territories and lawfulness in those territories. It'll eliminate the risk for a county to potentially abuse the requirement for a cooperative agreement. Most importantly, the bill recognizes and respects the sovereignty of the Mille Lacs Band and every other tribe. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Solicitor General Dog Eagle. Chief West. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members, my name is James West. I'm here representing the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe as the Chief of Police. My testimony is in support of Senate File 2251. In the past 32 years, the Mille Lacs Band's Police Department has developed into a robust and progressive department with educated, experienced, and highly trained sworn license officers. Our former police chief was a sitting member on the Minnesota Police Board. Currently, we employ 21 officers who enforce tribal, state, and law, federal law through Mille Lacs, Pine, and Aiken counties. Our officers respond to an average of 9,000 calls for service per year on land and water. Our police department partnerships with many state, local, and federal partners and affiliate with several task forces throughout the state. Our support for modifying the statutes is our experience in 2016 of a county revoking a cooperative agreement and terminating our tribe's ability to enforce state laws within its community. During the revocation of the agreement, we were given a protocol outline that threatened arrest for impersonating a peace officer if we attempted to exercise our state law enforcement authority. We essentially had to hand over our abilities to effectively provide public safety in our own community to the local sheriff's department. Proactive and progressive policing in turn went to reactive response policing and ineffective public safety. During a time when opioids and overdoses were starting to hit our community hard, our police department had to take to the sidelines and watch as nothing could be done. This was a horrific and terrifying experience which lasted for a period of two years. No law enforcement agency or community should ever have to go through this experience as we did. Tribal nations have their state law enforcement authority dictated by a local county in which they share concurrent jurisdiction. The power to authorize state law enforcement authority should not rest in another local unit of government. This power should rest at the state level. The current statutes regarding tribal law enforcement are outdated and need revision. It's time to recognize and respect tribal nations for the sovereign governments they are and to be treated fairly and consistently with all other units of government. Mr. Chair and members, I ask for your support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for your testimony. We'll ask uh, the two testifiers to return to the audience and invite uh, uh, Chief Prem to come forward and uh, Secretary Treasurer LaRoque to come forward, please. <coughs> Chief Prem, you're the one I have next on the list here, so go ahead. Thank, um, thank you, Chair and yes, members sir. of the and members. Uh, my name is Mike LaRock. I'm the current Secretary Treasurer of the White Earth Nation. Uh, I'm a retired law enforcement. Uh, I'm, I was the Director of Public Safety, Chief of Police for the White Earth Tribal Police Department, and I uh, support this bill, 2251. Uh, I've been there. I worked for the White Earth Tribal Police Department for 18 years. When we very first started working for them, one of our contract, one of our uh, cooperative agreements was not enacted through Clearwater County. I'll back up a little bit with a little bit of history. Uh, White Earth is one of the largest tribes in the state of Minnesota. We have uh, uh, agreements with Becker County, Clearwater County, and Monoman County. When I first started my law enforcement career with White Earth, uh, Clearwater County would not get into a cooperative agreement with us. The sheriff there refused to get into agreement with us. Uh, hindering us from providing criminal jurisdiction in our on in Clearwater County and the reservation boundaries. Uh, when the new sheriff, when the sheriff retired and the new sheriff came aboard, his first duty was to get into the get into the agreement with us. So get into a cooperative agreement with us, and it's been going well ever since then. I want to talk a little bit about worst case scenario and best case scenario. When you talk about Mille Lacs, that's that's a worst case scenario deal with these cooperative agreements. Uh, with White Earth in our three counties, it's actually been working very well, but that can always change at a, at a drop of a hat. There is some hiccups with it. There is, a, and I understand the umbrella of the county being over the tribal police departments is what kind of hinders some of the, some of the agreement. Uh, our police department is, is well funded. 
our police department is, is well educated. They're well, they got, we got the best equipment, we got everything, and we're equal to the county agencies that we, that we serve with. But that's the problem. We need to serve with them, not for them, in my opinion. With this bill, I would say that it basically, it, when it changes from may to shall, I think that's a, that's, a good, that's, that, that's a good thing for tribal police departments. One other thing I would like to mention too, under our, not under our agreement, but we, we've uh, been able to, as a tribal police department, get the law enforcement services agreement with the city of Manoman, which no other tribal police department has done, I believe, in the state of Minnesota, or even in the country, I believe. So, but we, we've, take, we've gotten that agreement with them for law enforcement services for the city of Manoman, which sits directly right inside of our jurisdictions. We, at that point, at that time, the county agency was not able to fill that agreement, that law enforcement agreement with the city of Manoman. We picked it up and we've had it for the last 10 years. If this, if the county decided to get out of the, the cooperative agreement with us at any time, that would take away our right to have that contract with the city of Manoman. It would be very detrimental to public safety in the White Earth area, on the White Earth Reservation in those three counties that we serve. So uh, I support this. I thank you for my test. Thank you for letting me testify today, uh, Chairman and members. Uh, miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaRock. Chief Prem. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, good afternoon. My name is John Prem. I'm the Chief of Police for the Prairie Island Tribal Police Department. This is my 29th year working as a peace officer in Minnesota, and for the last 19, I've worked for the Prairie Island Indian Community. We're the official police department of the Prairie Island Indian Community, a sovereign tribal nation located in Goodhue County. For context, the Prairie Island Tribal Police Department was established in 2003. The police chief and first two officers were hired in early 2004. Today, the department has an authorized strength of 14 licensed peace officers and a community service officer. Three of those officers are tribal members. Our officers are licensed by the Minnesota Board of Peace Officers Standards and Training, which means that we're required to have the same training, education, and testing as any other licensed peace officer in the state of Minnesota. I'm here today asking for your support of the proposed modifications to the requirements within state statute 626.90 to 626.93 specifically regarding tribal law enforcement's ability to exercise concurrent law enforcement jurisdictional authority. Mr. Chair and members, imagine if the city that you reside in was mandated to sign a cooperative agreement with the surrounding sheriff's department as a condition of establishing your city's police department. It couldn't exist without the signature of another elected official. Imagine that the county decided to rescind the mandated agreement, essentially preventing a city from serving its constituents. It sounds kind of absurd. In fact, no local unit of government would operate that way and none in Minnesota are required to except the sovereign tribal nations covered under the existing law. According to the Minnesota Post Board website, there are currently 418 law enforcement agencies in Minnesota. Of those, only eight tribal law enforcement agencies are subject to the requirement of having a cooperative agreement in order to exist. Originally, there were nine tribal law enforcement agencies subject to this requirement. However, in 2019, Senate File 1100 passed providing an exception for the Prairie Island Indian community. At that time, we heard many concerns about how removing the requirement for a cooperative agreement could affect law enforcement in Minnesota. I'm proud to say in the almost four years since Senate File 1100 passed, none of the concerns brought up have come to fruition. For example, the change in language did not limit or reduce the jurisdiction of any other state, county, or local agency. It didn't extend or alter the tribe's jurisdiction or that of its police officers or reduce the amount of oversight for our tribal police officers. What has happened since Senate File 1100 passed? Well, our cooperative agreement with, the, with Goodhue County and the City of Red Wing is still in place and has been since 2004. We continue to have strong relationships with both entities. We also continue to have strong relationships with Dakota County, the City of Hastings, and we rely on them for mutual aid. Perhaps most importantly, we've shown that the Prairie Island Indian community has the capabilities and resources to protect its community and enforce state laws on tribal lands. We have good working relationships with a number of law enforcement agencies. These cooperative relationships are the foundation of public safety. They're built on trust and mutual respect, not on mandates. The proposed change is about fairness and equity. It's time to change the law and recognize and respect tribal nations for the mature, responsible governments that they are. 
Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. Thank you, Chief. Um, that uh, concludes the list of testifiers that I have uh, for this bill. Um, there is an A1 amendment. Members, um, <clears throat> has it been distributed? Yes. It's been distributed to uh, the members. Um, this will be an author's amendment. Um, Mr. Backus, do you want to? Well, here, we'll do the author's amendment. Senator Umu Verbaten moves adoption of the A-1 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, to the amended bill, uh, any uh, Senator Umu Verbaten, anything you want to add or uh, before we go to member questions or discussion? Any questions or discussion from among the committee members? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've had an opportunity to uh, review some of the tribal community's requests for uh, uh, recognition as separate law enforcement agencies. And uh, as I've reviewed them, uh, at least the ones that have wanted to move in that direction, I would tend to think, or I would tend to conclude that they're, they have the equipment necessary to do that. Uh, the uh, I think always we should always ask the question, uh, is there, do they have the equipment, do they have the manpower, do they have the established practice and expertise and personnel to do the job for their community? Um, some tribal communities are much further along than others. And so um, this is more of a global uh, agreement, let's call it, uh, all of the 11 Tribal communities, I believe, are included. I believe um, Prairie Island uh, has already received a status. But um, can I get some assurance that every one of the remaining tribal communities are equipped and prepared uh, with the proper manpower and equipment and all of the other requirements necessary to uh, fulfill their job of public safety? for their community. That also is a concern of some of the sheriffs that are involved with those same communities. Could anyone answer that for me? Senator Umar Verbeek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Umar, I think we heard in the testimony, um, and again, I, I would point to um, Sovereignty Day that we just had on Monday, just the great work that our tribal um, police officers are doing. I'm, I heard some amazing stories when I was in that breakout room about um, that true community policing, um, knowing members, knowing their stories, um, being able to respond in a crisis and ensure that um, everyone, you know, makes it out of that situation safely. Um, I have full trust in our. Um, sovereign nations to govern themselves. And uh, I think that, frankly, they're doing great work that we can learn from, that um, uh, that law enforcement across the state of Minnesota can absolutely learn from. So that's that's my assessment. I would like to respond, Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Leroy. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, with White Earth, uh, it's it's not only it's it's not only the the do that we that we're looking for it's it's looking for the the better cooperation, because we're not we're not doing this thing alone. We're doing this thing with all the county agencies. We're doing the thing we're 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 providing public safety with the state patrol, with with the federal entities, with all the state entities and stuff like that. So I think this just puts us on a level playing field that we we deserve as tribal nations, and we basically. It, I think it would it would go a long ways with us in the cooperation level of it. So even though I spoke earlier a little bit about how we have very good cooperative agreements with our counties, that could also change in a heartbeat. But to have that over our heads is one of the things that I think is 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 hindering some of our process. So with this bill going forward, it would be able to strengthen strengthen our cooperation with our local law enforcement people that we're at. Miigwech. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's true. Senator Lemmer. Uh, I have no problem in recognizing uh, tribal communities deserving 
uh, their own law enforcement independent of uh, a cooperative agreement with surrounding law enforcement. No problem at all. Okay. I'm just asking the question, are you well prepared? Is everyone well prepared to take this responsibility on right now, all 11 tribes as depicted in the bill? That, uh, that's all I'm asking. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Mr. LaRock. Yeah, I, uh, I can only speak for White Earth. And uh, what, I can, what I can tell you is that as far as uh, some of the other tribal chiefs in the area, when I was the chief of police and the director of public safety, we talked about strengthening our whole group by having like a tribal police chiefs association where we could be able to share our knowledge and share our, our, our stuff that we do on each one of uh, on each one of our, our tribal nations and strengthening that so we do have so we are prepared to do it where I believe with White Earth and I can only speak for White Earth Nation that we have been prepared we've been prepared for a long time uh, I can only speak for White Earth thank you, uh, thank you. one other question Senator Chairman, uh, to those that may not be able to be here and speak on their own behalf um, Senator um, it does this give uh, does this grant or does this give permissive opportunity for a tribal community to move in that direction is this a granting decision or or is it a permissive authority that they can do it sometime in the future let's say if they're not fully equipped or fully prepared senator umover bed thank you mr chair senator Lummer. so again our our tribal law enforcement are are licensed just like uh, you know any other officers in Minnesota the issue here is really that requirement to have the cooperative agreement so that is what we're removing with this bill removing you know the requirement that you have to be in this agreement with with the local sheriff in the local county any further discussion uh, on Senate file 2251. Senator Umover Baton moves at Senate file uh, 2251 as amended, be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. Mr. Chairman, Senator uh, a, a new testifier just came up to the table uh, to participate. Senator Lemmer, have you had your question answered? Uh, I was just trying to be uh, welcoming this new testifier, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Senator Lemmer. Uh, our new testifier has already testified. Uh, unless you have any further questions, Senator Limmer, I'm prepared for a vote. It's your call, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Limmer. On Senator Mover Baton's motion that Senate file 2251 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the floor, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Senator Latz, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate File 1332. The new members don't really realize that if I don't get an answer. This is yours, mine. Senator Latz, I see you have a delete all amendment. Do you want to add that on first? Yes, I do, Madam Chair. This is our first stop. It's an author's amendment. I move the A-1. Senator Latz moves the A-1 author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, the uh, private attorney general statutes were passed in 1973 that gave individuals the ability to enforce uh, certain laws in Minnesota. Um, by bringing their own private cause of action to obtain justice and relief for harm caused by any violation of the consumer protection laws the Attorney General enforces. Uh, these statutes are considered to be remedial, which means that they are uh, in the public interest by definition. <clears throat> the purpose of these types of statutes are to compensate consumers when the loss is relatively small and would be equal to or less than the cost to hire an attorney to recover the loss. Um, or to deter 
and to deter future violations of the law by that perpetrator and other bad actors. Um, so in other words, if there's a, a 25 cent loss because there were some uh, billing charges um, that it would make no sense for an individual to bring a loan, um, but if, they can, if it can be brought on behalf of all consumers under the consumer, consumer fraud statutes, then there is uh, enough uh, recovery available to make a lawsuit viable. Um, the private attorney general statute operated as intended for 27 years. There were no bills or attempts to undo it or modify it. And no one alleged any problems with its intent or implementation until there was a Minnesota Supreme Court case in 2000 called Lee versus Nystrom. Uh, in that, the uh, Supreme Court deprived consumers of their ability to take action, obtain compensation for wrongs, and get attorney's fees by instituting a new test that was not actually in the language of the statute called a public benefit test. As Justice Page noted in his dissent, the court did so without statutory authorization. As he wrote, quote, reading into the statute that which the legislature by its plain language has left out. Since then, it has been impossible for an individual person who was defrauded or deceived to get through the courthouse doors. The Delete Everything Amendment does two things. First, it restores the private right of Minnesotans to take action if they are defrauded in violation of the Consumer Fraud Act. In other words, it overturns Lee versus Nystrom just for the Consumer Fraud Act. Not all the consumer uh, statutes under the Attorney General's enforcement jurisdiction, but just the Consumer Fraud Act. And second, it limits the right to bring a cause of action to natural persons and family farmers. In other words, corporations uh, would not be allowed to bring a cause of action. Uh, because of Lee versus Nystrom, these types of fraudsters can operate with impunity. The shady timeshares seller, the phony prize solicitation huckster, the home improvement scammer, the dishonest solar panel peddler, or the loan modification con artist. This amendment that you have before you today, now in the bill, reflects discussions and represents a compromise with a set of stakeholders who expressed concern about the bill as originally introduced. Finally, we're not inventing a new right here. We're only restoring to consumers what was originally in the statutory language and what the Minnesota Supreme Court erased in the Lee versus Nystrom uh, case. I have with me to testify today University of Minnesota law professor and my former colleague in the Attorney General's office, Prentice Cox. Welcome, Pro Professor Cox. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Did you want to proceed with your testimony? Thank you, Chair Pappas. Uh, my name is Prentice Cox. I'm a professor of law at the University of Minnesota. Before that, I was uh, manager of the Consumer Enforcement Division at the Minnesota Attorney General's Office and a colleague of Senator Glatz. I'll be very brief. Uh, Senator Glatz has laid out the essential uh, issue here, which is simply a restoration of a right that existed before, uh, before a Supreme Court decision. Uh, that decision had two dissents, one by Justice, uh, two dissenters, by Justice Page and Justice James Gilbert. Um, neither the facts of that case nor any other actual case brought to the court prior to that suggested the need for the imposition of a public benefit restriction. The result of that case has been that individuals and family farmers are routinely dismissed under the Consumer Fraud Act. Class actions, on the other hand, generally can proceed and meet the criteria of the public benefit test, which focuses on whether there was a one-on-one -on -one transaction. Oddly, business plaintiffs do quite well under the public benefit test. So what's happened is that businesses can bring suit generally under the Consumer Fraud Act, but actual consumers cannot. All 50 states have a private right of action for consumer fraud. Uh, a review of all those 50 state laws by the National Consumer Law Center described Minnesota's uh, laws as weak uh, and that the public benefit restriction, quote, makes it extremely difficult for consumers to bring suit under the statute. Only six other states have imposed a public benefit restriction. Uh, interestingly, three states, Illinois, Connecticut, and Hawaii, 
had such a, uh, a restriction imposed by the courts and overturned it by legislation as you are asked, being asked to do here today. This law would not, and port, uh, the last point, the law would just bring Minnesota back into the mainstream of other states and allow consumers and farmers to use the law as they were allowed to use it when it was passed in 1973 until Levy Nystrom was promulgated by the Minnesota Supreme Court in 2000. Thank you, Chair Pappas. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Cox. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing done, Senator Latz, um, uh, is this amendment going to the floor? It's going to the floor. Senator Latz, if you want to move your bill as amended. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 1332 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. Any other questions? Then all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. On your way. Thank you, members. Mr. Chairman, maybe we could invite my first two witnesses to come forward. Yes, members, we have Senate File 1504 in front of us, Senator Pappas. And if the testifiers on this bill will uh, come on forward, please. I have on our list here. Mr. Bonke and Ms. Hill. Thank you. I had to find it on our long agenda here. Yeah. Mr. Bonke and Ms. Hill, please come forward. And members, the plan She's is to lay here. this over Mr. for Mr. possible inclusion um, in a later on of this bill. Okay, I'll just Senator start Pappas. out. It's been a long day, and um, we may not have quite the same testifiers. Um, okay, great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, according to Minnesota law, if an inmate has served at least one half their term of incarceration, the commissioner of prisons may grant them a conditional release so they can look for paid employment or enroll in educational or vocational programs. A 2014 Minnesota DOC evaluation showed that the program reduced rearrest, conviction, and incarceration by 15%. It's also less expensive than incarceration, saving taxpayers up to $16,000 a year for each person in the program. 22.5% of the Minnesota prison population meet the criteria for work release and have been assessed as low risk, but only half, 12% of those who are eligible can participate. Expanding work release would help Minnesotans save money while lowering crime rates and the impacts of mass incarceration on the community and save the state a lot of money. Um, I have with me from the Coalition Home for Good, Mr. David Banke. And it's Banke. Banke, sorry. Banke. Mr. Banke, Senator Pappas, thank you for getting the name wrong so I could get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Banke, please provide your testimony. Yeah, thank you all for being here. I'm David, I'm from the Home for Good Coalition. Um, grateful for be, to be here with you today. Um, and excited to talk about how we can make our community safer while saving money. Um, I think there's also a kind of at a crossroads in corrections right now. And there's a question of whether or not we're going to invest in sustainable safety solutions or whether we're going to invest in the same problems and kick the can down the road. I have two questions for y'all today to think about. Um, one, do you want to release people homeless or do you want to set people up to succeed when they are released? It's wild to spend hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars to incarcerate someone and then drop them off at a homeless shelter with a couple hundred dollars. Yet, yet this is the case for 25% of people released from prison last year. They were, released, they were homeless over the course of the last year. Um, this is what work release pre prevents, I'm sorry. It guarantees people housing during their transition it guarantees them housing while they're looking for a job, while they're working, while they're saving, getting them transportation, or continuing the college education. In short, this program puts people to work instead of making them homeless, reducing crime, 
while being incredibly safe. Less than 0.2% of people commit a new felony crime while on work release. Even better, it's less expensive than prison, which means we can and should increase safety while saving money. Second, I wanna ask us about how we're investing money and what is the correctional path we're taking moving forward. There's a couple key issues around this. Prison staffing, prison safety, and prison capacity. Prison staffing crashed during COVID, yet was balanced out by population reductions. And while this is partially recovered, in the governor's current budget, they're requesting $200 million every year while projecting a 1,200-person increase in the prison population. Unfortunately, this means that we're gonna spend $200 million a year to end up with the same problem in two years. Also, um, so th this puts us back into a staffing and capacity crisis. This also jeopardizes <laughs> the earned su success suggested by the MRA, because currently, we if we don't have staffing, we don't have programming. And if people don't have programming, they can't earn a release under that program. Unfortunately, we also have lockdowns if we have short staffing, which means that we have a mental health and safety crisis in our prisons. In the House, the commissioner promised that the current budget would prevent the need to build a new prison. Unfortunately, it won't. It would just kick that question down two years. So I think the question is, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna invest in a path that we create safety and reduces the prison population or not? And we should also understand that we have two very old aging prisons in Stillwater and St. Cloud. Finally, th please pass SF 1504 and, don't, and ideally do better than that. And don't let the governor put $90 million a year into keeping the lights on. Expand work release to a point of half of that to do seven interrelated things. One, put low-risk people to work. Two, end re-entry homelessness. Three, reduce crime and prison violence. Four, provide a sustainable solution to prison staffing and capacity. Five, expand college success. Six, create an incentive for change in line with the MRA, both in prisons and in re-entry. And finally, save money. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Benke. Uh, Ms. Hill. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Tamara Hill. I'm here in two capacities today. Uh, first, as a registered lobbyist and policy officer with the Center for Victims of Torture. And second, just as a person whose life has been affected by having family members in incarceration. Um, on the organizational side, CBT was founded in 1985, and we're a nonprofit that's headquartered in Minnesota, and we have operations in other parts of the U.S., Africa, and the Middle East. We provide a, a variety of services, including rehabilitative care to survivors, and we engage in advocacy that's aimed at ending torture and cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. And uh, just prioritizing advocacy and policies that allow people to thrive as opposed to just survive. Our healing, incarceration, and policing program, which is the program that I manage and am the lead advocate for, uh, uplifts legislation and supports our clients and communities in Minnesota uh, while increasing equity and accountability in our public safety infrastructure. Our work at CBT encompasses total and holistic healing, which allows people not only to survive, but thrive. And in that spirit, uh, we've been heavily involved in the movement to expand work release and support Cinephile 1504. The expansion of work release is an investment in our state's public safety. It's been proven by DOC data to keep recidivism low, decrease homelessness of those released from incarceration, ensure dignity and success through financial independence, and reunites families. It adds to our economy and helps ease the burden of DOC staffing shortages. And people want to go to work, and they want to go to school. They want to do better, better themselves, be released, and get their lives on track. Um, these people who go on work release are assessed as low risk by the DOC. They're ready to go back into a community. Uh, they've been rehabilitated. And funding shouldn't be the only barrier keeping people who are otherwise rehabilitated inside a prison cell. This legislation is also supported um, not only by CBT, but other community-based organizations like Jewish Community Action, the NAACP Legal Rights Center, and more. Um, 
In addition to these reasons, I also encourage you to support the expansion because of the impact it has on children, families, and generational experiences for people in Minnesota. Personally, my father was arrested when I was four, and when I was a teenager, he was released. And I met a man for the first time as a father who was a complete stranger to me. Because of my father's choices, I grew up in poverty in a single parent household. From the ages of 16 until I finished my master's degree, I worked between 30 to 55 hours a week to put myself through school twice and assist my mother with bills, rent, grocery, groceries, and uh, caring for my younger brother. An expansion of a program like work release could have significantly altered my upbringing. It could have allowed me to know my father sooner, um, and it could have alleviated much of the financial burden that was put on me as a child and as a young adult. So work release expansion is imperative, not just for those on work release, but for the families and children of those who participate too. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hill, for your testimony. Senator um, Pappas. Mr. Chairman, it uh, just occurred to me a couple things, and that is, you know, we have a workforce shortage in Minnesota, and um, so there's a number of strategies to increase that. We can't afford to leave anybody behind. We need to get everyone educated and into the workforce. And this is a population, formerly incarcerated people, that could be a good source for workforce. It's kind of selfish for us as a society. It's good for them, but it's also something that we need as a society. And the other thing I wanted to mention is Stillwater and St. Cloud are both over 100 years old. And how much rehabilitation, how much renovation can you actually put into prisons that are that? They're poorly designed. They're not safe. They have dark corners. Um, they're not very humane for the, uh, the incarcerated persons. They don't have enough rooms for, uh, for training, for classes, for therapy. Um, they're really, really very outdated. And do we, I don't know how much it costs for a new prison, $100 million, $200 million? Do we really want to spend that? I mean, we should really be putting that, those dollars into people that we can rehabilitate and, and, and have a win-win. So we're putting people back into the workforce and we're avoiding the cost of having to replace one of these prisons, let alone expanding prisons. There's no way we can do that. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Any questions or comments from Ms. members Kaplan, of the committee? Ms. is number one on my list. <laughs> Any questions or discussion? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the, the specific appropriation is for uh, to increase work release programming um, and to facilitate the expanded use of work release. Are we talking about increasing existing programs, or are we talking about creating new programs? Yeah, Mr. Pappas. Chairman, uh, these are existing programs. We already do do work release, but it's very limited financially, and I think the commissioner can probably address that. And I think the commissioner also has a proposal, and we support that, but we'd just like to see more. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, mean, I know there's existing work release and that's already being done. I, I was just trying to confirm whether this would just be money in that existing program or if some of it would be go to a new program and then um, can you Mr. Explain? Chairman, Senator Kroon, just building Senator on Pappas. the success that we have with the current program. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you explain uh, real briefly, I know it's two different bills, but just high level what the difference is? are between the one you had just mentioned and this one? Um, Mr. Pappas. Chairman, I, I guess I'm not familiar enough with the Department of Corrections. We did, I did meet with the commissioner about it, but I don't know that there's significant differences. I think we're just saying we'd like to see more. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Right. Senate file 1504 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Senate file 1191, Senator Westland. And Ms. Freeman from the Secretary of State's office, you can come on forward as well. Members, the packet is being distributed to you.
Senator Westland, when you're ready, please describe your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senate File 1191 is the early voting bill. It has been heard in elections, and um, just for purposes of level setting, we have a very narrow portion of the bill that is actually within the scope of the Judiciary Committee. Um, I think Ms. Primo can probably confirm, but my understanding is that the sections that are subject to, to this committee's jurisdiction are uh, Section 7 on page 7, and section 62 on page 40, uh, both of which, um, Mr. Chair, have to do with um, data. Ms. Uh, Primo, can you please confirm those are the two provisions we'll be discussing today? Mr. Chair and members, yes, those are correct. Thank you. Senator Westland, a, a brief overview of the, of the bill and then to the two provisions before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do also have an A20 amendment so uh, perhaps we could take care of that first. Um, the A20 amendment is yes. basically technical corrections based on the passage of Restore the Vote. All right, this is uh, not an author's amendment since the bill came to us from another committee. Uh, Council, Ms. Primo, uh, to the A20, is this a technical amendment? I think it's... Mr. Backus, I think. Or Mr. Backus, whichever one of you. Um, Mr. Ms. Backus. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar enough with the election laws to qualify it. My, my understanding is it does conform with the bill that passed on uh, expanding voting rights for people with felony convictions, and it amends those uh, reporting uh, provisions accordingly. And that's about all I can speak to it. So, Mr. Chair, I can perhaps take a stab at this, and Ms. Freeman can help as needed. So, basically, um, previously, um, if a person were um, uh, on probation for a felony offense, they still were not, uh, not able to vote. So, if you look at the A20 amendment, um, it removes language that is no longer applicable because of restore the vote. So we are striking language um, 1.5, 1.6 um, reports of people who have been convicted of a felony. Um, 1.7, 1.8 um, because we, not, we are proposing or in one of the election bills we have pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds. Um, this uh, changes that Commissioner of Corrections report to include those 16 years of age or older who are currently, and then um, the change comes, incarcerated for felony sentences. Um, so again, this is to conform with the restore the vote, um, the changes that were made um, based on the restore the vote to comport with that language. All right, Senator Weston, I think what we'll do is we'll hear the uh, testimony from your testifier. Um, if there's any clarification that's needed, uh, we're also trying to locate Senator Carlson, uh, the chair of the Elections Committee, to verify that uh, he's okay with us taking this up. Um, uh, and and uh, by the way, this bill will go back to the Elections Committee um, from here in case uh, there's anything more than technical corrections being made. We may leave it to the Elections Committee to, to fix it there. Uh, Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Nicole Freeman, Office of the Secretary of State. Uh, Could you I will please just give us a 30-second overview of the main point of the bill itself and then focus your testimony on the data practices provisions that are before us today? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this bill is uh, the Office of the Secretary of State's administrative bill uh, is sort of how we've been uh, uh, talking about it. Uh, it includes many technical as well as small policy changes. Um, there are uh, things, very technical changes uh, related to uh, the use of um, particular terms uh, to standardize them across election statutes, um, as well as making small changes uh, to uh, expand timelines for various voting activities, such as um, ballot boards, as well as uh, direct balloting timelines. Um, we also have a few 
uh, changes that are made as as a response to um, court opinions that have come down um, to make sure that our statutes reflect what the court has said. Um, in section seven, uh, we are, uh, the secretary has met with both, uh, mo both party chairs, major party chairs, um, who participated in the last presidential pr nomination primary. And um, they are all in agreement that uh, we should make this small change to clarify that uh, the the data that will be shared with each major party chair who participates in the presidential nomination primary, uh, that the party chair will only receive the data for the voters who selected that party on that day. Um, and then uh, back in section 62, um, this is data, uh, excuse me, this is a uh, new clarification related to cast vote records. Um, cast vote records have become uh, something that, that folks are, more folks in the community as well as election administrators are, um, are being asked for. Uh, and so county election administrators have asked our office uh, questions about what is public, what is not public on a cast vote record. And so uh, this provision seeks to clarify what would be public um, as well as uh, balance, balancing um, voter privacy. Uh, so there are some provisions to um, protect non-public data uh, so that someone's, you know, the, the date, time, and order in which someone casts a ballot, you couldn't, um, you know, watch a, for example, watch a security camera of people walking into a polling place and be able to place, you know, this person voted first and then second and then third. Um, and so, like I said, just uh, provisions to protect voter privacy while also uh, clarifying that portions of that cast vote record can be made public. Senator Weston. And Mr. Chair, I apologize. I don't, I may have referred to this as the early voting bill, and if I did, I apologize. I'm also carrying that bill. This is, this is the agency bill for the, for the Secretary of State's office, just so we are clear. And I don't know if I did misstate that or not, but I had a brief moment that I may have misidentified the bill. Thank you for the clarification, Senator Westland. Uh, now, uh, Senator Carlson has uh, uh, joined us here and just going to ask if you take a look at the A20 amendment, Senator Carlson has proposed. Uh, I just want to verify that um, these are technical in nature, so our committee is not making any policy changes relating to uh, Elections Committee jurisdiction. Also noting it's going back to the Elections Committee from here. Mr. Chair, if I can uh, give you a quick opinion on it. It looks like Senator it's all under the... Uh, Jurisdiction of the important parts are under the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, of the A20 amendment? Yes. All right. Um, how about on line 1.7? There is a change from, of uh, the years of age for an individual. 1.7 on the amendment. Is that a conforming change or is that a policy change that the Elections Committee should handle? Mr. Chair, it appears like, Senator and I've been Carlson. advised that uh, this is conforming to the voter regi uh, sorry the voter um, registration bill that allows early ed registration. All right, so we so seem to already, have a. I'm sorry, it's already been heard. So, members, it, it seems that we have consensus from those who give us guidance on these questions that the A20 amendment involves technical corrections uh, following up on the voter restoration bill, the restore the vote bill. Um, and uh, since the bill before mm -hmm. us is an elections related bill, it would be appropriate to put those technical corrections in this bill. Um, so I don't have any problem with the concurrence of the chair of the elections committee adopting a technical corrections amendment in this committee. Um, are there any questions on about the A20 amendment? Not seeing any. Senator Westland moves adoption of the A20 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, to the bill, uh, any discussion uh, in particular relating to sections 7 or 62 that are 
the subject of this committee's jurisdiction. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page 7, oops, I guess that is not in section 7. My mistake. I withdraw that. Is there any further discussion on Senate File 1191? I am not uh, hearing any. Uh, Senator Westland moves that uh, Senate File 1191 as amended be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Senate Committee on Elections. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Westland. Next up, uh, Senator Limmer, are, are we able to take up? Uh, your bill, uh, yes, your next. Why don't you go ahead to the testifiers table so we can put you in the hot seat for a few minutes. Senate file 682 members, the uh, packets are being distributed. Senator Limmer, when you're ready, go ahead and describe your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> this bill uh, is basically in two parts. I'll go over the first page first. Um, section 1 adds a three-year felony penalty for a person who places an emergency call reporting a fictitious emergency with the intent of prompting a response by law enforcement, fire, or an EMS personnel. And as a result, if someone suffers substantial bodily harm, uh, then of course it would be um, breaking, a break of the law and it would be considered the base crime for doing this is a gross misdemeanor. It's a 10-year felony if the response results in someone's death. Um, section 2 on the back page uh, involves the, the uh, element of restitution. Now, uh, the chairman and I have had a discussion about this particular portion of the bill, and we realized that um, first on line 2.4, the word shall is a direction to the courts. They kind of frown on that when we tell a third branch of government how to do their business, uh, which raises the question of whether or not we need the restitution portion of the bill or the portion in the bill at all. Uh, the uh, court always has the uh, discretion to consider any restitution to a, to direct a direct victim of a fictitious emergency, and certainly uh, a payment in uh, 2.9 uh, restitution payment that does not limit the liability for damages in a civil action. So, if that's already kind of boilerplate. Uh, for a court to consider. I'm not quite sure if we need it in this particular bill. Uh, I do have a question for counsel, however. On lines 2.6, um, that direction to the court or a suggestion to the court, is that necessary as well or is that considered something that would be uh, uh, a discretion of the court that would be somewhat of a common practice to consider in a sentence. And if it if it is not, then maybe we should leave it in the bill. Uh, but I would consider striking the balance out. But I would need direction from counsel. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Lemmer, it's something I would have to verify by looking through statute, but I don't believe that you would need that. I, I think they would, I, I believe they would have the authority to order restitution to the agency, but it's something I can try to check. I know, uh, Senator Latz, you and I have discussed this, and that was the only question that we had on line 2.6 and 7, of whether or not we should leave it in the bill. I'd be uh, happy to amend the bill. Uh, 
either take out yeah. everything from 2.3 uh, down to the end of the end of the bill and remove it. Uh, if 2.6 is necessary, is uh, something that the courts don't commonly do or consider, then I'd want to leave it. It's, uh, I would leave it up to the committee to make a decision. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Mr. I'm, I'm looking at the definition in 611A.01 of victim, and it does include, among others, government entities that incur loss or harm as a result of a crime. So, Mr. Chair, uh, hear, hearing that, uh, that it commonly does, did I hear that correctly? It, it, it's, uh, Senator Limmer, it sounds like the language existing in statute is broad enough to include the kind of loss that's described more specifically right. on line 2.6 and so on. So, Mr. Would Chair, you agree, Mr. Uh, Backus? I believe. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would. Okay. Senator so, Limmer. So, Mr. Chair, uh, I would like to amend the bill uh, to remove lines 2.3 through 2.10 to strike those lines. Senator Limmer moves to delete section 2 of the bill. Any further discussion on this amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. To the bill, any discussion, uh, any public testimony in connection with the bill? Not hearing any. Uh, Senator Limmer moves that Senate File 682, as amended, be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Senator Seaberger, are you ready for 1596? Yes, we are, Mr. Chair. Senate File 1596, Senator Seaberger. Staff will hand out the packet. Senator Seaberger, when you're ready, go ahead and describe your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I am here before you on Senate File 1596, which has to do with the Office of the Ombuds for Corrections. The Office of the Ombuds for Corrections is a neutral and independent investigator of complaints regarding Minnesota Corrections Agency actions and policies. The office contributes to overall safety and wellness of those who work and live in correctional facilities, and having that level of independence is critical to doing that well. This bill helps protect that independence by ensuring it is as free as possible from outside control or influence, or even perception of it by clarifying that the ombuds person can only be removed by just cause, which is the language included for other Minnesota ombudsman offices. Ombudsman Margaret Zadara is here to give some additional information about the office and this bill when the committee is ready. Welcome to the committee. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Margaret Zadra, and I am the Ombudsperson for Corrections. Grateful to be here today. Uh, because this is the first time we're, we're here before you this year, I'll just do a really incredibly brief introduction about the office uh, um, and then talk really briefly about uh, SF 1596. As many of you, um, as you know, uh, due to the diligence and bipartisan work from so many of you uh, and so many community members, the Office of the Ombuds for Corrections was newly recreated in the 2019 session. And the office was set up and began taking complaints in 2020. The office is completely separate and independent from the Department of Corrections. And the statutory mission is to promote the highest attainable standards of competence, efficiency, and justice in the administration of corrections. Part of how we do that is we receive, investigate, and resolve complaints and provide an impartial and unbiased process for incarcerated individuals, corrections staff, and community to share concerns about corrections agencies' actions and policies. 
We have unique uh, and critical access to data and information that is typically not available to the public, and we can provide an independent and impartial review of issues and concerns. We regularly, uh, beyond taking complaints, we're regularly in facilities and visiting facilities uh, and provide additional opportunities for less formal interactions with both staff and incarcerated people to share concerns. And we um, are able to observe those policies and processes in action as well. We provide education and information to help people navigate the correction system. Uh, and one example of that is this year we embarked on a collaborative pilot project with the DOC to provide additional information for families at a monthly uh, pilot meeting. We publish reports and make recommendations to the DOC, the legislature, and the governor. And in this way, we can take issues that may be brought forth by one or two or a handful of people and make recommendations that make the processes more just and more efficient for everyone. The bill before you today, SF-1596, came about as we are looking at best practices across the board, including our own best practices. We realized our own enabling legislation could use some tightening up. HF 1596 provides removal only for just cause. As a government oversight entity representing the people of Minnesota, the office should be as free as possible from outside control or influence or even the perception of it. The possibility of removal from office and retribution for carrying out an unpopular investigation or making a critical report or for political reasons can be a real or indirect threat to the independence of the Ombuds Office. The United States Ombuds Association standards, uh, which are the national standards, as well as the international standards, include removal only for just cause. And this bill will bring our office in line with other Ombuds offices in Minnesota. You also have in your packet an, a letter from the Ombudsman for Mental Health and Development Disabilities in support of the bill as well. I know we've been here a long time, so uh, I'll stop there. I don't want to take up too much time. It's a pretty straightforward bill, but happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Ms. Zadra. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the committee? Not seeing any. Uh, Senator Sieberger moves that Senate File 1596 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Sieberger.
Democrat, Senator Umu Verbatim. Senate file 1334. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this bill will update and modernize a number of statutes that govern the work of the Department of Corrections. Uh, the bill includes a broad range of policy directions uh, from the legislature to the Department of Corrections. Many of these proposals are even currently practiced, but they just simply need to be updated or set in state statute. These are all common sense changes that will help the Department of Corrections operate more efficiently and more effectively and just improve uh, public safety um, in our state. And I have Commissioner Paul Schnell here who can testify in support of the bill and provide some more detail on the contents. Commissioner Schnell, welcome to the committee. Tell us what, what we should know about this bill. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, my committee members, Paul Schnell, Commissioner of Corrections, and I appreciate the opportunity to walk through this. As Senator Um of Ray Payton stated, uh, much of this bill is technify, technical clarifying or modernizing of uh, changes to statutes governing the DOC's work. First, in the pr proposal adds a statutory requirement that the DOC implement a language access plan. Uh, currently, there is no requirement for the DOC to have language access plans in place in facilities or for individuals under supervision who have limited English proficiency. We've been working on implementing policy changes to improve access to translation services, but we do believe this should be a requirement of statute. Second, um, the second component repeals an unused uh, statute around community intensive supervised release. This uh, program has not been operational since 1995 and is often confused with uh, intensive supervised release or ISR. Uh, one of the goals uh, of the antiquated program was to punish the offender, which is uh, the role of the court, not the role of the Department of Corrections, and not in alignment with the agency's mission, um, and, uh, and has been a, a focus of concern for community members for some time. In addition, the program was used as a model and justification for how ISR currently operates. Um, moving from mainly a surveillance system that often had poor outcomes to uh, now a more modern approach to evidence -based using evidence-based practices. The next provision of the bill is an automatic me mechanism to shift funding when a county requests a change in the supervision delivery system. Currently, when a county chooses to have the Department of Corrections provide supervision services, the statutory structure does not allow for those appropriated funds to come directly to the DOC, who uh, now has to provide those services in that county. Instead, the funds go to the general fund, and we are required to make a separate budget request to get those dollars reallocated. Um, we believe that this would be a, a simple change that would allow for dollars already appropriated for these purposes to simply be um, aligned with the Department of Corrections to provide those services. The next change updates substance use disorder treatment standards of care in, sta uh, in statute to align directly with the community standards and the Department of Human Services waiver. Currently, a current statute requires the directs that incarcerated individuals complete SUD treatment without consideration for assessment recommendations that is necessary to determine appropriate placement and treatment settings. This update reflects best practices and allows for easier access to care for individuals upon release. The next provision simply allows the Department of Corrections to electronically send uh, requests for disposition or detainer paperwork to the court and or prosecutors. Uh, current statute requires uh, using certified mail with return receipt. This bill modernizes this process and allow us to use uh, existing systems uh, that uh, improve efficiency. The next change provides uh, the DOC with the authority to issue a warrant when an individual who was given a report date um, for, uh, to report to prison fails to do so. Under current statute, the DOC does not have the authority because the individual is not technically in DOC custody. 
When a defendant fails to report, we must ask uh, the county or the prosecutor uh, or the court to request a warrant um, so that that person can be uh, brought into custody. This can be a clunky and time-consuming process that is sometimes uh, challenging and uh, can impact public safety. It would be far more efficient for the DOC to have this authority to issue that uh, warrant when a def defendant fails to report uh, to serve their prison sentence. The next provision allows for the operation of challenged incarceration or CIP at the state's only women's facility. Current statute only authorizes the DOC to run the program at Togo and Moose Lake. However, for the past six years, CIP, often referred to as boot camp, has been provided uh, at the state's only women's prison in Shakopee. Outcomes are equally successful and uh, is a popular program for both men and women. This proposal updates and clarifies statute to reflect current practice of offering CIP at Shakopee. The next update clears, clarifies membership on the uh, Advisory Council for Interstate Commission for Adult Supervision and the Interstate Commission for Juveniles. It's a technical change to align uh, current Minnesota statute with interstate compact council makeup requirements uh, and the process to ensure appropriate and adequate representation is mandated by law and the bodies may operate with one a dual purpose. Next, the bill uh, updates line of duty death benefits to include staff providing correctional supervision in the community and non-uniform staff working in the state's prison. All staff who work in our facilities and those providing supervision in our communities face the same potential uh, threat as law enforcement and correctional officers, and we believe they should be covered by these same benefits in the event, God uh, forbid, of such a tragedy. Next, uh, the bill provides um, that in the event of a potentially fatal infectious or contagious disease, that the Department of Corrections can consider conditional medical re uh, release when uh, the other requirements uh, in the statute are met. And lastly, the bill provides the Department of Corrections uh, with the authority to place juveniles who are sentenced as adults to the most appropriate setting. Juveniles incarcerated in the adult are currently incarcer incarcerated in the adult facility at Lionel Lakes do not have access to uh, age-appropriate services like those offered at Red Wing facility. This bill would allow the commissioner to place juveniles sentenced as adults in Red Wing while they uh, are still juveniles. Mr. Chair, I believe this covers uh, the issues in the bill, and if there's anything else, I can certainly stand for questions or clarify. Uh, members, I will uh, just note that uh, the commissioner went through the provisions of the bill as if we had already adopted the author's amendment A2, so we'll do that right now. Senator Umu Verbaten uh, moves adoption of the A2 as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Um, I will also note, members, that uh, included in the A2 amendment are the contents of Senate File 1449. Uh, which is Senator Westland's uh, bill. Um, if this amendment, if this uh, Senate file 1334 moves forward, we will not be taking up 1449 as a separate uh, matter today. Sorry, Senator Westland. <laughs> Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just wondering if the challenge incarceration uh, provision is also in this, or it is. To expand yes, to Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Senator Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you look at um, the A2 amendment on line 5.16, I believe that covers um, what was in your bill, Senator Pappas. Great. So, Mr. Chairman, we don't have to take up that Senator bill. Senator Pappas. Then. That is correct, Senator Pappas. Any questions or uh, discussion from members of the committee relating to Senate File 1334 as amended? Senator Limmer. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm looking on the back page on the repealers, and uh, it looks like uh, the bill wants to repeal Chapter 244.14, Intensive Community Supervision. 
as well as uh, 244.15 intensive community supervision phases one through four. And could you t explain to us what that is and why it needs to be repealed? And is there a replacement for it? And how does that work? Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, that uh, intensive community supervision is really a change and it now is the ISR program. So it's intensive supervised release, which does remain and is active. Uh, this, this ISR was really uh, created to replace uh, the uh, community intensive supervised release program. And Mr. Chairman? Senator Limmer. Um, Commissioner, are the elements the same for intensive supervision or are they different and where where are we moving from and to commissioner Schnell. mr chair senator limmer uh the the objectives uh were the, the objective of isr were built upon the same provisions of uh community intensive supervised release program but uh, updated um, to really recognize uh, and apply best practices uh, to them. So there was not, I mean, there were some, uh, wasn't substantial changes, but it really was more, much more focused on the types of outcomes, uh, addresses both surveillance, but also uh, all of the other requirements, uh, including the, the number of visits uh, that are applied uh, based on uh, a person's involvement in the ISR program. Those provisions remain and are dictated, along with caseload size and so forth. And Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Does the concept of good time change the definition of good time from two-thirds to something else in this bill? Commissioner Snow. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, uh, no, this is an entirely focused on uh, those people that would be subject to release on supervised release on under intensive supervised release. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Uh, members, uh, because one of the provisions in here may have a fiscal implication, which Mr. Turner is working on determining. Um, we are going to lay Senate File 1334 over for possible inclusion. If we find out before the end of our hearing today that there is not a fiscal implication, um, then we will move 1334 out separately. Otherwise, we'll hold it until, uh, unless Mr. Turner has an update right now. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, 1334 didn't have a fiscal impact until uh, Senate File 1449 was amended into it. And right. <laughs> Senator Westland is the cause of this. <laughs> right. So Mr. Turner, are you evaluating whether or not, or do we know? Uh, when, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Turner. Members, um, that's going to have a cost. We have a, a fiscal note in. Um, it is part of the governor's recommendation, that section of law, to expand benefits to public safety officers. Um, yeah. Mr. Chair. Senator Umu Verbaten, apparently there is a provision here that state government, state and local government committee needs to see. So, 
Okay. This may be a surprise to you, but <laughs> that's what we're all consulting about. Um, so uh, the appropriate motion right now is going to be for Senate file 1334 as amended to be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the state and local government committee. And then uh, it'll be a little more clear by then whether it can go where it goes from there. Uh, either way, it's, it's going to make its way through the process, but we just need to have the right path and procedure. So, uh, Senator Umu Verbaten moves that Senate File 1334 as amended be recommended to pass, be re referred to the Senate Committee on State and Local Government. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. If you want to stay where you are, Senator Umu Verbaten, we can do Senate File 2495. Senator Umu Verbaten, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The purpose of this bill is to set down a clear rule barring the use of intentional deception by law enforcement officers during interrogations. It accomplishes that end by making it admissible in court any statement that arises out of an interrogation in which deception is used. The rule is simple and easily administrable. Officers will know what lines they are not allowed to cross. This bill provides an appropriately strong incentive to promote compliance. Specifically, this bill excludes a statement when the officer knowingly uh, communicates false evidence, misrepresents the accuracy of facts, or communicates unauthorized statements regarding leniency. Uh, I'm going to share just a few more reasons as to why um, folks should support this bill. The first is around preventing false confessions. The use of deception is a major cause of false confessions, which in turn are a leading cause of wrongful convictions. And lying to suspects about the evidence that officers have can be psychologically disorienting, particularly for young um, and vulnerable individuals. Second reason I would say is really around community, building community trust. Um, the use of deception degrades community trust and the moral standing of law enforcement. Think about how we teach folks that lying is wrong, especially our kids, right? And we should not accept less of people that we really expect to be those role models in our community. And I think it's really important now more than ever that we um, are supporting practices that improve confidence in law enforcement. And then lastly, it's it's been found to be a very ineffective practice. Um, deceptive practices are just ineffective tactically. And so when an officer lies about the evidence that they have, a suspect who's actually guilty may have information that allows them to know that the officer is bluffing. Um, so once the suspect knows that the officer is lying and doesn't have um, that information, the credibility is destroyed and the officer is going to be less effective in obtaining a confession. So for that reason um, and others, um, one of our largest police training organizations has abandoned the use of deception. Um, I will pass to uh, my testifier, though, to share some more information uh, with the committee. Right. Mr. Markler. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today in support of Senate File 2495. My name is Andrew Marquardt. I'm a managing attorney at uh, the Great North Innocence Project in Minneapolis. Uh, we represent individuals who have been wrongfully convicted of crimes and advocate for public policies intended to prevent wrongful convictions. And what we've learned over time is that there are certain factors that predictably and repeatedly lead to wrongful convictions. And one of the big ones is false confessions. And I think a lot of people hear that, they think, I can't imagine ever confessing to a horrible crime I didn't commit. 
but we, we know it happens. Um, it's actually in about 30% of DNA exonerations where we know they're innocent. That person co confessed at one point, so it happens. Uh, so why do people confess to things they didn't do? There's a lot of reasons. One of the big ones, though, and one of the easiest ones to target, frankly, is the use of deceptive interrogation tactics. So that's what this bill is about. And the most obvious example is the kind of classic false evidence ploy. So the officer says, you know, you say you weren't there, but how come we have your fingerprints or your DNA or you're, you're on camera? Um, and there's robust psychological literature at this point showing that this thing is really manipulative and can um, really psychologically disorient people and can lead to false confessions. People can actually be kind of gaslit into questioning their own sanity, um, into wondering whether they had a blackout. Um, and uh, particularly when, but not exclusively, when you're talking about younger people, people who are less sophisticated. Um, so that, that's, that's what this bill is really uh, targeted at combating. Uh, as the senator described, it, it, it's simple in the way it works. It only applies if someone knowingly uh, engages in these uh, prohibitive tactics. And, and that, that modifier is really important because we're, we're not trying to trip up officers who make good faith mistakes, who are simply mistaken or misunderstand the facts. Uh, it's really about deliberate, intentional lies. So they know where the line is, they know not, not to cross it. And I think, you know, this bill actually clarifies and makes easier the standard for officers in some respects. Under current case law, you know, the courts disfavor the use of deception, but you never really know whether and under the totality of the circumstances, uh, a statement's gonna throw, be thrown out. With this bill, the officers will know. They'll know where the lines are. They'll know how to avoid them. So this is part of a growing movement around the country. Mm -hmm. There have been a number of states that have passed similar bills for juveniles, from you know more blue states like Illinois to very deep red states like Utah. Um, and there's a movement to go beyond juveniles, particularly in law enforcement agencies around the country of all sizes are, are pulling back on the use of, of deception. So you're gonna, you're gonna hear uh, a bit from Mark Fallon who's gonna be testifying remotely. Um, and amongst other very impressive credentials, he was the federal government's chief investigator for Al Qaeda military commissions after 9-11. Uh, so this is someone who's dealt with the most high stakes interrogations of the most dangerous people on earth. And he's going to tell you that not only does deception lead to false confessions, it's just bad policing, it's bad tactics. Uh, it doesn't take account of scientific advances in understanding of how to get information out of people effectively. So the bottom line, this bill is not taking away an effective tool, it's bringing policing into the 21st century. Um, so thank you and I, I hope you will support and we'll stand by for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Marquardt. We will go to Mr. Fallon, who is joining us virtually. Good afternoon, Mr. Fallon. Go ahead and identify yourself. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Mark Fallon. I'm a visiting scholar at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm testifying in support of SF2495. My first sworn job policing was as a police constable in Connecticut in 1976. In 1979, I became a deputy U.S. Marshal and in 1981, I became a career special agent with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, the NCIS. I was taught and I believed that an innocent person wouldn't confess to a crime they didn't commit. We also carried revolvers and blackjacks, smoked in police cars and buildings, and we didn't wear our seatbelts. Children didn't need car seats. There were no iPhones or computers. We didn't know about DNA or the science behind effective interviewing or how and why people confessed to crimes they didn't commit. We do now. When I became the director of the NCS Training Academy in 2004, we were teaching confession-driven tactics. When I became the assistant director for training of the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in 2008, we were not using research to instruct federal agents on how to interview. In 2010, I started working with the High Value Detainee Interrogation Group. I am the past chair of the HIG Research Committee. I have worked with research scientists around the world on improving the practice of interrogation for more than a decade. The HIG has conducted over 120 peer-reviewed studies that have been the catalyst for major interrogation reforms in agencies that have embraced the science and improved their competencies 
with science-based interviewing skills. Confession-driven and deceptive practices have been rejected and global interrogation reforms are underway. Today, FLETC only instructs science-based interviewing methods and NCIS is among the growing number of agencies that have rejected outdated legacy tactics and improved their competencies in search for truth. At John Jay College, I am co-director of Project Aletheia, a center to bridge the gap between the science and practice of interrogation. We now know that deceptive police practices contribute to false confessions. We also know science-based methods produce more accurate and reliable information without the collateral damage of legacy tactics. This requires a shift in mindset and institutional cultures, an evolution away from deceptive tactics towards truth-seeking approaches. This isn't about taking tools away from police. It's about improving their skills and competencies. Effective interviewing is tradecraft, not stagecraft. Policing with virtue will foster public trust, uphold the rule of law, professionalize the practice of policing, and move us a step closer towards community-embraced policing. I urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fallon. Um, is there any uh, uh, discussion or questions uh, relating to Senate File 2495? Senator Cruin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, doesn't existing law already address this? I mean, doesn't a, a defendant have the right to challenge uh, a statement in court? And one, one of those grounds be whether or not the statement was based on deceptive practices? Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kroon. Yes, um, they do have the ability to challenge that, but what this bill is aiming to do is to really set forward a very clear, bright line um, and prevent this harmful practice. And the data really does show us that um, the use of this is leading to false confessions. Um, I will also ask if Mr. Marquardt has anything he'd like to add. Mr. Marquardt. Yeah, th I mean, there is a mechanism for, for challenging the admissibility of, of statements based on voluntariness. Um, it's under a totality of the circumstances test, and the courts have been clear that they don't like deception. Uh, the Supreme Court has called it dirty business, the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, they said, we caution police as, that they proceed on thin ice and at their own risk when they use deception. And I, I think if there's anything... Uh, and Minnesotan worth their salt noses, you shouldn't proceed on thin ice. But uh, the reality is uh, the rules are not clear and um, deception alone is not a basis for getting a, a statement thrown out. Um, officers, prosecutors, they don't really know, I mean, how it's gonna go into the, into the blender and come out. This provides a very clear rule so you know where the lines are and you know how not to cross them. Senator Crone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but wouldn't a totality of the circumstances test as determined by a judge on a case by case, wouldn't that be actually a better test than to define it into statute? Because every case is going to be different from one another. And um, if the judges already greatly frown on this and they're already discouraged it and they've already made, make rulings that um, confessions are inadmissible, um, it seems to me we would want to analyze this on a case-by-case -case basis, and that would be a better approach. Mr. Markworth. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I take your, your point, Senator. Um, but I, I think the reality is that this bill is addressing more than just the voluntariness concerns. That's certainly part of it. Uh, is that we're we're concerned about voluntariness, but we're uh, you know we're also concerned about just the the moral aspects. Of, of lying and the effect that has on public confidence in policing. You know, I talk to a lot of people about this issue and my, I teach at different law schools and do a lot of teaching. People, this just offends their basic moral sensibilities. And so I think this bill is addressing more and bro a broader set of concerns than the case law addresses. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, if, if if we're talking about a situation that is offensive to moral sensibilities, that's, I'm sure, a very likely case that uh, that confession is going to get thrown out by a judge. 
I'm more worried about the gray areas and creating a statutory scheme where valid confessions are thrown out um, because we are unable to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. We're unable to have the judge use those, the existing framework to make those determinations. And that's what I'm concerned about here. Did I understand that we will be the first state in the nation that's going to enact a statute like this for adults? Mr. Chair. Senator, move for bid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kroon. Again, I would say that I think this provides more clarity by creating a very bright line. Um, and there is legislation moving through other states. Other states have banned the practice for minors, um, but have not for adults. Mr. Chair. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, seems to me if we're gonna make this kind of shift and be the first state in the country to enact this kind of statute, we ought to get some sort of buy-in from law enforcement. I'll note for the record that the uh, Minnesota Law Enforcement Coalition is opposed to this, and that represents the Minnesota Peace and Police Officers Association, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, and the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. I have grave concern about moving forward on this type of legislation without um, bringing those organizations into the fold and coming up with some sort of language that uh, is workable to those um, constituents. So, um, you know, I, I simply can't support this legislation. Mr. Chair. Senator Umo Verbit. Thank you. And, you know, I have seen the, uh, the letter. I just received it last night. I will just point out that the... Um, arguments made there around concern that we would be first in the nation to provide this sort of protection, um, noting that other states have um, passed this just for minors, uh, noting that current law, um, uh, that folks can currently challenge this in court. Um, there's nothing around, um, you know, concerns about this being a tool because as we have discussed, it's really a counterproductive tactic and the research shows that. I would just respectfully disagree. I think, um, you know, Minnesota really has an opportunity to take pride in um, building trust between law enforcement and the communities that we serve. Um, we can learn from the other states certainly that have um, banned this, this practice with minors. Um, and again, we can establish a very clear rule. Um, so when I look at those concerns, um, I, I just res you know, respectfully disagree and think that this is an opportunity for us to move forward. Senator Westland. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question. Um, so currently a defendant can raise a challenge to the voluntariness of the confession under current law. But specifically as it relates to challenging voluntariness based on deceptive practices, how often, if you know, how often has a defendant been successful in having a confession thrown out based on um, deceptive practices? Mr. Marquardt. Um, so uh, under the case law, governing case law in Minnesota, the use of deception in and of itself is not a basis for per se exclusion. So in the cases where you do have exclusion, there's usually some other factor in addition to deception. Um, some other problematic practice or, or something about the, the situation that, that undermines confidence that the, the statement is an act of free will. So the, there's, I don't have statistics for you. Uh, it's not that frequent, um, but uh, it, they tend to be very fact specific and you will, you will always have some other element beyond that. Senator West. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that response. And, and, and just as a brief comment, you know, when, when a person is in custody, um, they are in under the entire, the, the control of law enforcement, um, their environment, their surroundings, when they sleep, when they don't sleep, the length of the interrogation, a, a lot of things. And it seems to me that um, when we have a practice that more often than not 
um, may result in false confessions um, that it does not serve, as, serve criminal justice. It does not ensure that we are um, obtaining justice. And so I um, support this bill and thank um, Senator Umu Verbatim for bringing this forward. Mr. Chair. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Whether or not a confession may be excluded from evidence is based solely on um, whether or not there's deception involved. You're saying that's rare. And I guess the, the response to that is that's probably because the voluntary, voluntariness of the confession is really what the court is looking at. And so the court is going to look at the totality of the circumstance and they're going to address other factors involved. And maybe there was one part of the interrogation where uh, an officer said something uh, that wasn't true, but it was completely immaterial or largely immaterial to whether or not that confession was voluntarily made. And I think that's what we're trying to get at is whether or not the confession is voluntary. So is there anything about materialness in this? Um, or is any kind of misstatement or inaccuracy uh, used at any point in the interrogation, whether or not it gets to the point of questioning the voluntary nature of it, is there any exception or any carve out for that type of situation? Or if there's one uh, false statement made by a police officer, does that take the whole thing out? Can you walk me through that? Mr. Senator Chair. Mugabe. Um, Senator Kroon, again, knowingly is very important here. We're not trying to, um, uh, you know, catch someone in making a mistake that they, they weren't aware of. I think that's very different from intentionally using deception um, in an interrogation. If I can go to Mr. Marcourt. Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kroon, um, thank you for the question. Uh, the, so sort of uh, circling back to some points that were previously made, uh, the, the answer is that it, there is not language in here that, that does create that kind of nexus between the statement and the deception. It, it was written uh, to be very simple and uh, as uh, Senator Uma Rabain has emphasized, to be very easily administrable. Um, so it, the language does not require that kind of connection. It's meant to draw a very clear line and make it very easy to apply. Is there any further discussion on Senate File 2495? Where's it going? Not seeing any further discussion, Senator Umu Verbaten moves that Senate File 2495 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. We're going to take up Senator McEwen's bill now, Senate File 1384. OSHA data classification. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Senator McEwen, we're giving you a break from transportation, a more <laughs> relaxing committee here in Judiciary. I'm very pleased to be here. Senate file uh, 1384. Go ahead and describe your bill when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Senate file 1384 is a bill making some modifications related to worker privacy and data transparency in Minnesota's Occupational Safety and Health Act. This includes prohibiting management or management representatives from being present during Min OSHA interviews with employees and making data in a citation issued by Min OSHA public 20 days after the employer has received a citation. Additionally, the bill clarifies how the period of time allowed for correction of violations where an employer is contesting the time for correction will run in violations that are not serious, willful, or repeat violations, as well as for those that are serious, willful, or repeat violations. The bill also modifies and simplifies requirements for employers that have fewer than 25 employees to have a safety committee. 
And with that, Mr. Chair and members, I also have um, one of our professionals from DLI, the Department of Labor and Industry here, who can speak to the bill and can also answer any questions um, technically about it from the committee. Good afternoon, sir. Go ahead and identify yourself and proceed. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Latz and members of the committee. My name is Josiah Moore, and I am the Legislative Coordinator at the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 1384. Uh, this bill before you today makes two policy and technical changes uh, that are uh, typically under the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee, so I'll limit it to those two in my testimony. Uh, first, the bill clarifies that both current and former employees are not subject to subpoena for purposes of an inquiry into any occupational safety and health inspections under the section. Uh, and second, the bill improves the transparency of Minnesota OSHA citation data. This change would classify written citation data as public 20 days after the employer has received the citation. This proposal would allow Minnesota OSHA to provide timely information to the public and stakeholders about its enforcement actions, which would encourage employers to take the necessary steps to keep their employees safe. Additionally, the, this legislation would align Minnesota OSHA with other OSHA programs across the United States, including federal OSHA and all the states neighboring Minnesota. Uh, each of these changes makes an important update to Minnesota OSHA policy. These changes support the workers, the employers, and the occupational safety and health professionals whose shared goal is to move Minnesota forward as a leader in workplace safety. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate File 1384, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, members, uh, as noted, Sections 2 and 3 are within our jurisdiction, especially Section 3, if we can try to focus our questions on that, if there are any. Uh, and uh, for your information, uh, this will be going back to the Labor Committee from here. Are there any questions or discussion on Senate File 1384? Senator Lemmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Senator McEwen, I uh, was looking over some of the supplemental information on our bill, and there is a letter from the Associated Builders and Contractors, I think, of Minnesota and North Dakota. They're, uh, they're opposed to the bill, and uh, they were making reference uh, that sometimes employees would like to have the employer present in certain circumstances. Um, do you have any provision that would allow an employee to uh, request that their employer sit in on that interview? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Limmer, for that question. I do not have a, a provision that would allow for that. I think that goes contrary to what the purpose of the statute is trying to achieve. Um, I, I think that the employee can bring another representative or another support person into that interview if they so choose. The problem is if you open the door to allowing an employer or a representative of the employer to be in that interview space, um, it, it truly does open the, the door to an expectation potentially um, that an employer would sort of volunteer an, an employee that they uh, ha they might want to have someone there. And if the employee refuses that or suggests that maybe they don't want that, of course, there's a concern that there's some sort of coercion there or some sort of an intimidation possibility. So the whole point of this provision is to remove that element so that the Minosha representative, the people conducting the, this investigation can have an open conversation with an employee without the possibility or even the appearance that an employer is trying to interfere with that investigation. And I don't, perhaps my expert also has something else to add or a different perspective, but um, that's my perspective on the matter. Senator Lemmer, uh, I appreciate your inquiry. It's, it's, it's provision not within the scope of our jurisdiction here. If you want to ask oh. some limited follow-up, go ahead, but All right. please try to focus questions on sections two or three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, maybe you can uh, give me direction uh, if I stray. Uh, I had, did have another question, and that would be um, 
again, coming from the association builders and contractors, a concern that uh, this type of process, the nature of the investigation, may create an appearance of guilt until proven innocent by the named contractor. Um, does this bill have any concern for the contractor? Senator McKeown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Liber. The process does have quite a bit of concern for the employer. Um, the process of investigation as a whole, um, really setting up parameters and rules under which information is provided to the employer, a citation, the public nature of it, when it becomes public, um, the employer knowing what they're being accused of and being able to respond under the, the rules of how this, this works. Um, but um, Senator Limmer, my, my, my sense is that, and you know, all of us know that in the criminal context, um, when a, a, a accusation is brought under uh, a prosecutor finds probable cause that someone has committed a crime, that complaint is made public, so the nature of the allegation is very public, uh, potentially, if a reporter chooses to report on it, they can. Um, this is sort of the nature of transparency and allowing the public to understand um, what's going on. If there is an accusation that somebody has violated a law in the criminal context, or if an employer in the context of um, an OSHA a violation is accused of having um, done something incorrect, that there's a certain amount of uh, transparency that should, that the public expects. And so I, I do believe that the, the statute as a whole achieves a good balance of that. And this is actually um, just making sure that it's very clear in the timelines, like when are things going to become public, which aspects will be public. Um, and then at the, at the end of that section three, um, this subdivision four that will be added um, also specifies that if the employer um, files a notice of contest so that they're going to actually contest the accusation that has been brought against them, it also specifies that that, that notice, the date that the notice would be filed would become public 20 days after. So just providing more information for everybody. Mr. Chairman. Um, I noticed that the uh, publication of the nature of investigation is made public prior to it being fully adjudicated according to your bill. Um, compare that with an example like um, a case that is investigated of, of uh, a human rights violation by the Human Rights Department. That investigation is kept private until facts are fully established. And if there is guilt or a, a cause of action, then it becomes public. This is kind of in reverse. And the power of the government is very powerful <clears throat> when it starts to make accusations. Um, take, for example, in a criminal case, in a criminal case, the burden of proof is on the government. Uh, with those that are charged, and the assumption is is that you're innocent until proven guilty. Um, the concern of the builders states that in Min the Minnesota version of OSHA, a citation, the individual is, in their opinion, essentially guilt guilty until proven innocent and does not have to produce its original records with the evidence of the violation until after the notice of contest is filed and the judge sets discovery. So in this example, represented in this bill, we're, we're running contrary to, let's say, other government uh, investigations that we have uh, by the state of Minnesota, such as in the case of a human rights violation. So in this regard, um, I think it's a little unfair to offer that notice uh, prior to it getting closer to a full full adjudication. Is there a question there, Senator Limmer, or is it just making the uh, well? I'm this, I'm just making comment, Mr. The comment or Mr. Chairman, that so Senator Limmer, I, I this have is running contrary to other examples when Minnesota state government creates investigations, possibly with impugning 
uh, the character of an individual or a business. Sure. I was just trying to determine if you if it was a statement or a question. I wasn't I sure understand. if I should be seeking a response directly to that or not. Um, but I, I'm a little concerned about the same thing. Um, in a criminal case, you know, the accused can get the police reports as soon as they can be printed out on a printer and delivered to the accused. Um, and uh, I'm not familiar with how all sorts of other investigations and other agencies go in terms of disclosure and so on or contested case proceedings in that regard, but a little bit concerned. I mean, certainly the in a criminal complaint, there's at least a narrative description, although it's written by the state, as to what the underlying allegations are. Um, but a defendant would have an opportunity, should there be a desire to, to publicly say those aren't the underlying facts and here are the reports that contradict what's written in the complaint or so on. Um, and that doesn't sound like it's the case here. Maybe we can get a little more context about this and why it still provides the employer with a fair opportunity to present the other side in public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator I think McEwen. I thank you very much. I think that that would be good uh, to get a little bit more context about how um, these investigations are conducted and completed, and and whether or not um, the depiction of and of, of the concerns that are being raised by this construction association are in fact accurate about how this works. Yes, so, and I've asked counsel also yeah. to thank you do a little checking on that as well, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Chair Lance, and thank you, Senator Limmer. Um, one thing I would like to clarify is that uh, when OSHA issues a citation, that occurs after an investigation has been completed, um, not just in response to receiving a complaint, right? So OSHA will have completed an investigation before issuing one of these citations that's in question. Um, and then I would like to clarify as far as conformity uh, with other, other examples, this would conform Minnesota to how federal OSHA already makes this citation data available upon issuance. Uh, and because every state surrounding Minnesota is a federal OSHA state, not a state plan OSHA state like we are, that means that we would be conforming to every state that borders Minnesota and how these and how this citation data is made public. So Mr. Moore, during the course of an OSHA investigation by the state, what information is shared with the contractor? Uh, thank you, Chair Latz. Uh, so the information that would be shared in the citation would include... I'm, I'm backing up. Before the citation, there's a complaint. OSHA starts an investigation. Haven't gotten to the point of a citation yet. What information is shared with the contractor during, immediately following the initial complaint and during the investigation? Mr. Moore. Thank you for the clarification, Chair. Uh, so when Min OSHA receives a complaint, uh, they do communicate with uh, the business contractor, what have you, uh, about what the complaint is. So that is not uh, kept. Uh, a secret uh, from from the employer. Is any other information shared with the employer, or just the the complaint uh, itself? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I can't speak to any more information that would be shared. I would have to follow up with uh, with uh, my team, my OSHA team. Uh, but I can, I can share that I, I know that the like, name of the employee who shared the complaint would not be shared, for example. And would part of the investigation then include uh, sending the nature of the complaint to the employer and saying, this has been complained of, what is your response? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, that sort of communication would be part of uh, the investigation of of the complaint. And then once, um, but during the course of the investigation, information may or may not be shared directly with the employer about what is being 
found during the investigation, right? Thank you, Chair. I'm just uh, trying to clarify. I'm not yeah, and I telegraphing think, <laughs> anything one way or the other. I'm just trying to figure this out. I think in reference to uh, the claim of what's shared, what, what information is shared with the employer when the citation is issued. Um, no, the, before the citation, but during the course of the investigation, is any information necessarily shared with the employer? Other than please provide us with a response or records or anything like that. Uh, Chair, I don't think I have anything else to add about the information shared with the employer prior to a citation during the investigation. And after a citation is issued, what is the department's protocol regarding sharing the factual basis for the citation other than what might be written in the citation itself? Thank you, Chair. Uh, as, as described in the letter from ABC that uh, Senator Limmer referenced, uh, that is accurate. The background documents they referenced uh, being sent once uh, the contest is filed is how, is how that works. Those background documents are not currently provided with the citation. So Mr. Moore, it seems to me that having background documents, if I were an employer, it would be helpful to me to have the background documents to know whether or not I ought to file a contested case rather than have to file a contested case in order to get copies of the evidence that's being proffered against me. Um, and then on top of that, the public citation being issued and not even be able to get the documents that underlie the citation until after I filed a contested case and a court issues a discovery plan, which unless, unless the ALJ is their Office of Administrative Hearings is a whole lot faster than district court, which they might be, I can see how there could be some substantial delay um, in that process. Senator McEwen, you look like you're Either you want to say something or you're trying to digest what I'm saying. No, <laughs> thank, other, thank you, expression. Mr. Chair. A little bit of both, probably, but um, I, I, I I have had these, um, when this bill first came, um, when we first heard this bill, I had some of these same questions and I was assured by OSHA staff at DLI that the employer does have full access to the file um, and are communicated with um, and worked with throughout the entire process. The concern, as I understand it, is again to protect the employee or who potentially brought this complaint. So. Um, if you would like, Mr. Chair, I would be happy to provide um, you and the committee with more detailed information about the OSHA investigation process in Minnesota, particularly as it pertains to um, how and when uh, how employers are involved, what, when they are given certain information, which information they are not allowed to see, just more detail around that if you and the committee would like to see that before moving forward. Uh, Senator McEwen, I would be more comfortable having that information. I understand, Mr. Moving Chair. Forward. I mean, you're, you're saying that they have full access to the file, which is quite different than from what the contractors are asserting in their correspondence to us. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so I guess I'd like to know what exactly the details are. Uh, I understand, Mr. Would be, Chair. It would be helpful yeah. in we can do evaluating that. that particular provision. So I think maybe what we'll do, I, I'll commit, if we have that information before second deadline, well, this is going to go back to labor anyway, but it would have to go back, I presume, before second deadline. Um, so it would be to everyone's advantage to move quickly. Yes. Um, but I'll commit to bringing this back before judiciary next week if we have the information and time to do that so we can make a decision as a committee on how to proceed. Okay. Fair enough, Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate um, your patience and your leniency to be able to do this. Thank yeah, you. No, thank you for the discussion. Um, Nicole here is probably going to be upset that I just promised to add another bill next week to the agenda, <laughs> but that's, that's the way it is. Um, so uh, for, for today, uh, uh, Senate file uh, 1384 is laid on the table. Senator McEwen, while we have your attention, 
and your presence. Let's turn to Senate File 1417. Yes. We do have a Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Senate File 1417 will require railroads to operate with a minimum two-person crew when transporting and delivering freight. Minnesota's Class 1 trains currently operate with two crew members. Codifying this practice into law is a common sense, bipartisan proposal that has been in the works since 2016. Requiring two crew members to operate a locomotive is about worker safety and the safety of our communities. Our railroads transport all kinds of goods, including very hazardous materials, as we know. Just two weeks ago, uh, a little over two weeks ago now, one of the most environmentally disastrous train derailments occurred in eastern Ohio. When derailments happen, having a second crew member is essential to begin efficient hazmat response. The second crew member is the one who communicates with first responders, decouples the train cars still on the track to move them to a safe distance, and more. Beyond safety concerns, having two crew, two crew members is essential to continued traffic and life in communities that our railroads cut through so that one can open blocked rail crossings to allow school buses, emergency responders, and the like, the public, to pass while other, the other continues operating the train. It is literally physically impossible for one person to perform all the duties required to safely operate a freight train. As technology advances, crew member responsibilities also grow. Our communities are not testing grounds for railroads to implement experimental practices. Heavy locomotives moving quickly with potentially hazardous cargo push the stakes too high to ignore. This bill establishes crew size standards that will protect our workers and protect our communities. I respectfully request your support for this bill. And Mr. Chair, um, I do have a testifier, Attorney Thomas Fuller, here to offer um, some support and to speak also to um, some of the legal aspects that we've been looking at that pertain to this committee's jurisdiction in particular. There's an argument ongoing about the issue of preemption, as I'm sure you can see, federal law preemption. So we can discuss that. He's here to speak to that. And we also have Nicholas Kadich, um, who is here to answer any questions about the bill as well. Thank you. So we know Mr. Kadich is on uh, virtually available to answer questions. Mr. Fuller is at the testifier table. Go ahead and introduce yourself and testify. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Thomas Fuller, and I'm an attorney at the law firm of Hunnigs, Leneve, and Kavas in YZ. Our firm has been representing injured railroad workers for decades. I'm here to address the preemption arguments raised by the lobbyists for the railroad. The railroad industry is less than forthcoming concerning the controlling law in making its argument that the proposed legislation requiring two-person train crews on freight trains is preempted by federal law. Nobody disputes that federal agency, the federal agency having authority to regulate the railroads, the FRA, has never 
regulated train crew size. This point is central to determining whether a state action, law, or regulation is preempted by a federal law. In other words, when a federal agency has not promulgated a specific regulation, then a state, like Minnesota, may enact its own law. The concept of preemption involves a federal law being supreme and preempting state law, which turns on the notion of uniformity throughout the nation. However, a state law or action is not preempted where it does not conflict with a federal law, as made clear as in the case CSX Transportation v. Easterwood out of the United States Supreme Court in 1993. In that case, case, it is recognized that it is not enough to show that a federal regulation or law merely touches upon or relates to a subject matter. Instead, the term covering is more restrictive and indicates that preemption will lie only, only if the federal law substantially assumes the subject matter of the relevant law. It's also important to note that in the context of preemption, courts are not prepared to find preemption solely on the strength of a general provision. In the Supreme Court case Easterwood, it's important to note that the Supreme Court has recognized in the context of railroad safety that a state may adopt or continue to enforce a law, regulation, or order related to railroad safety until the Secretary of Transportation prescribes a regulation or issues an order covering the subject matter. As I previously noted, it's undisputed here that neither Congress nor the FRA have enacted any laws addressing the size of train crews. Accordingly, Minnesota may regulate the size of train crews as made clear by United States Court, Supreme Court precedent, and I support this bill and uh, thank you and would be happy to answer any questions that you should have. Uh, so members, we are gonna go on to another testifier, but I wanna note that the, uh, you know, I'll be corrected by counsel if I'm wrong on this, but you know, this is only a three paragraph bill before us. The policy decision regarding the minimum num uh, number of crew members is really a transportation committee decision. It's not a judiciary question. Um, now, in that regard, the issuance of preemption kind of does, kind of does bring maybe the question within the judiciary's jurisdiction. But the second two paragraphs here, the proposed uh, fine schedule um, and the, uh, the venue provision are definitely within our jurisdiction. Um, so I think we're gonna, we, we expect to hear from uh, Raymond Atkins, I assume on the prevent, preemption issue as well. So Mr. Atkins, if you wanna come forward and provide us with your perspective on the, uh, the legality of the proposed policy change, and then we can have a, uh, a very high-end legal discussion on the Judiciary <laughs> Committee about that question. Mr. Atkins, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, my name is Ray Atkins, and I'm here on behalf of the Union Pacific Railroad. I'm a partner with the law firm of Sidley Austin, based out of Washington, D.C., and I am the former general counsel of the Surface Transportation Board, which is the federal economic regulator of the freight rail industry. My focus of my testimony here is exclusively on the issue of federal preemption. As you likely know and as you've heard, uh, once the US DOT has covered the subject matter of crew size for railroads, federal law prevents states from regulating in the same space. And preemption does not require that there be a specific federal regulation on crew size. Preemption can be triggered by a decision of the federal regulators that no specific regulations are needed. The courts refer to this as negative preemption. And in this case, USDOT has twice declined to regulate crew size because there was no safety data to justify a federal rule. Now I appreciate that you have heard uh, conflicting views on whether the feds have done enough to cover the subject matter and preempt state laws regarding crew size. But this legal uh, dispute will soon be meaningless. The Biden administration is poised to adopt new crew uh, size rules. Last year, they sought public comment on a proposal to mandate two-person crews and create a pathway to seek waivers 
from federal safety regulations. The Biden administration explained that one of the safety benefits would be the creation of uniform national requirements that would preempt state crew size laws. The final rules are expected at the end of this year or early next year. And so there really can be no dispute that once the Biden administration acts, no matter what it does, it will preempt this proposed law. So this proposed legislation is wading into an area where negative preemption already exists and where ordinary preemption will soon follow the comprehensive set of national regulations forthcoming from the Biden administration. The last point I would like to make is to caution this body that state regulations that specifically target the railroad industry are viewed with special scrutiny and can be preempted by an entirely different federal law, which is called the ICC Termination Act. To the extent that the proposed legislation would impose a burden on the freight rail industry and not on the trucking industry, uh, this provides an independent basis for any railroad to challenge the law as preempted. And with that overview, I thank you for your time and I would be happy to answer your questions. Senator Pappas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a brief anecdote um, from the past. Um, I actually remember a proposal for um, a similar bill back in the 1980s. It was called the Red Caboose Bill. And I remember it because I had red cabooses. <laughs> and Representative Alan Welly, may he rest in peace, um, was the House author at that time. I was in the House. So this whole idea of having um, kind of two-person trains uh, was eliminated back then in the 80s. And we can certainly see, given the train derailments and the importance of added safety measures um, on our railroad system, how important this is. Mr. Chair, I also Senator just wanted McKeown. to thank you. Um, I have the um, amendment as well, and I didn't know when the, if you, you would prefer to have discussion about all of this and then look to the amendment, or if we wanted to um, do the amendment now. Well, um, I'd like to contemplate the testimony we've already received, so let's take a moment to the A3 amendment now so we can think about the earlier conversation. The A3 amendment, which I think has been distributed, members, uh, defines, I assume, a term that's already used in the bill. Um, actually, I don't see the term no. shared corridor in the bill anywhere, do I? I don't, I don't have a copy. Page one, line six. Hmm? Ms. Kaplan? It's in a new language. Oh. Thank you. Okay, so under the A3 amendment, on line 1.8, there is a term called shared corridor, and then on line 1.3, it defines that term. Uh, unless this is a purely technical amendment, this is definitely not a Judiciary Committee issue. I'm not sure how substantial a policy argument it is. I did see the chair of the Transportation Committee walk in, but he may have walked back out. He's behind, I, I can't, oh, he's sitting behind one of our witnesses. So he's, Mr. Fuller is directly in the line of sight of Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble, um, there's an A3 amendment that's proposed on this bill. Have you seen it? We're going to get a copy to you because I'm questioning whether this committee has jurisdiction to adopt it. Um, and whether you'd like us to adopt it if we do have jurisdiction um, or if the Transportation Committee waives jurisdiction on it. So I guess. I'm, I'm loath to wade into other committees' jurisdictions, as you know, Senator Dibble. Um, sometimes we have overlap between transportation and judiciary, but the overlap is usually in the traffic area. Uh, traffic enforcement questions, not railroad regulation or safety regulations. 
Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the consideration, Mr. Chair. I would say that uh, this amendment is clearly within the jurisdiction of uh, transportation. Um, uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, I don't completely understand what the uh, amendment accomplishes. I would probably need an explanation of that. Um, but uh, as, um, as a matter of practicality, you know, depending on, on how, how substantive the, the change is and what the implications are, my impulse is to, is to not ask for the bill back should this amendment go on. I mean, the position I, the position I strike in my committee, Mr. Chair, is that I try in a very gentle manner to say, let's keep our amendments to the jurisdiction of the committee we're in, understanding that, of course, there is no mm -hmm. literal rule restriction on providing an amendment on any subject in any committee. There's you know, not that kind of, I, it's not, the term's not germaneness, but there is no rule pre preventing this. It's just poor form and poor practice, and it also runs the risk, of course, of a bill being referred back to a committee and interrupting its progress. So if someone could maybe help me understand the amendment a little better, that would be helpful. So Senator Dibble, I'm, I'm perhaps not as gentle as you are with regard <laughs> to that, that uh, practice, um, and I'm not inclined to take up our time right now sorting this out. If, if you wish to spend some of your time right now with anyone uh, and determine exactly what the implications may be. Um, so, well, you know, Mr. We, Chair. You're welcome to do so on your own time, and if we need to set this bill aside so you can do that and we can move on to something else, that's fine, too. We'll yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, this would be my suggestion. Um, to, to not take up the A3, it's clearly in the jurisdiction of transportation regardless, um, and the idea in A3 can be sorted out at some future point in time, whether that's in conference committee or on the floor or in some place like that. All right. So members, we will not take up the A3 amendment. So now we're going to return to Senate File 1417 in its original form uh, it, that's before us. <clears throat> um, let me ask this. Are there any questions or discussion with regard to the proposed fine schedule or venue provisions in Senate File 1417, uh, noting its willful violation, and there is a fine schedule, and I interpret this to mean that uh, any violation would mean any time a, rail a train is sent out in operation without the two crews would be considered a separate violation. So you could get, you could very quickly get to a third or subsequent offense within three years. Um, I assume I'll get corrected if I'm not interpreting that correctly. Um, but any questions or discussion about the fines portion or venue portion of Senate File 1417? Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I hadn't focused on this issue, so but but just looking at this, the uh, the venue, I guess. Um, what if uh, a violation occurs as it's the train is traveling? across the state in multiple counties, what would we do in that situation for venue? I would assume one could not assert there are multiple violations by simply crossing the county line, so it, it's not clear from this. I suppose any of those counties could be an appropriate venue, um, but you probably couldn't bring two actions in different counties for the, essentially the same course of conduct. Any uh, any impressions from council on this, Ms. Primo? Mr. Chair and members, I think venue in would be appropriate in any of those counties, and I'll point out that venue is also a waivable. Um, defense, so um, it, it, it could be brought in any of those counties and could be you know, a potential 
um, litigated issue between the parties or not, depending on the complaint. Let me ask a question about effective date. This is pretty unusual, making it effective 30 days following enactment, following final enactment. Um, not unheard of, sometimes we do day following, but usually it's July 1 or August 1, which might be pretty close to 30 days if this is one of the last bills out of the, out of the gate at the end of the legislative session. Um, but the reason I raised the question is because of the point that was made about mm -hmm. federal rules that might be issued and what effect an enactment date might have on, on that and any litigation that might follow from uh, the enactment of this bill into law. I've, I've been informed that it's likely if this bill were to become law that there would be a fairly uh, certain lawsuit following it um, and then there'd be a question of whether or not the law would be suspended while the lawsuit's pending. That question would go before a judge, how long it would take for litigation to proceed, all the while the feds are moving forward on whatever rules they're going to uh, adopt. Any feedback from our two testifiers on questions of enactment date and effect on preemption? Uh, Mr. Fuller? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't really have much to comment other than... Um, the effective date, if Minnesota was to enact this legislation, um, wouldn't really impact the preemption analysis from a judicial standpoint, I don't believe, because once it's enacted, then we're going to have, I suppose, this uh, preemption fight in the courts. So I think the sooner that it's effective, perhaps the sooner there's clarity surrounding that. And I'm not so sure that um, the position that well, we expect the federal government to make a ruling on crew size really changes the preemption analysis at all, other than supporting passing the bill and that it's not federally preempted at this point because there is no federal law on the subject. hope that answers your question. Mr. Ch Atkins, your thoughts? Uh, I would tend to agree that it, it doesn't necessarily affect the constitutionality of, of the provision, but in order to bring a challenge against a state law, you do need to, make, to, to set forth standing uh, in order to, to proceed forward. And if so, if the effective date were, they say, a year from now, hypothetically speaking, it would be challenging to bring an immediate action again to challenge that bill. You would have to wait until you get closer to, the, to there actually being a, uh, a ripe uh, injury that the, the, the railroad is likely to suffer. And so th that's, that's the only, the only uh, implication I could see. It doesn't actually go to the, the underlying consti constitutionality of the provision, but it actually might affect the timing of when a case could be brought against uh, the state and your, the state officials seeking to enjoin its enforcement. Okay, and then my next question would be, what role should the preemption question play in our determination here in the Judiciary Committee as to whether or not to pass this bill. Um, we've kind of, we've touched on this conversation before, Senator Cruen, when we talked about constitutionality and whether we should take that into consideration in determining what to do with a policy proposal before us. Senator Cruen, do you have any thoughts on that right now? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, I would just be looking to save our taxpayers some dollars and having to defend this lawsuit. Um, and I would think that the preemption issue um, is something we should be concerned about. Regarding going back to the effective date, another implication of when the effective date is, I guess, would determine um, the type of lawsuit, I would imagine, in some regards, that the railroad company is going to bring because um, it's either going to be focused on negative preemption or on traditional preemption, depending on what the federal administration does with respect to the rulemaking and, and how the timing of that plays out with the effective date of the statute. But I sense there's going to be a lawsuit coming regardless because the railroad's position is that negative preemption already exists. And so, um, you know, I, to me, I don't, I don't really have any opinions on the policy behind it, but I do have opinions on whether we should be moving this legislation forward when there's, uh, one, it could be moot, 
in a matter of months, and, and clearly everybody would acknowledge that preemption exists. Two, um, even if before that ruling by the federal government, as far as I can tell, this the negative preemption is pretty clear. I mean, I, I was going to ask a question about the 2016 um, agency decision and, and, and then the subsequent withdrawal order and how that plays into negative preemption because it seems to me like the federal government has already looked at this issue, made a conscious decision to not enact uh, regulations on it and with the specific intent that negative preemption then applies. But I'm just wondering if, if both of the lawyers at the table could talk about that 2016 um, notice of proposed rulemaking uh, event and then the subsequent withdrawal order. Mr. Fuller. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. So I think that's the point that because they have withdrew that and it was a notice of proposed rulemaking, not an actual order, then it can't negatively preempt or preempt the entire field. And so we have to go back then to whether or not there's an actual specific law enacted that could preempt um, this two-person bill, and there's nothing there. Um, I would um, direct to a decision that Judge Leun uh, entered after a Minot derailment, and there was a preemption um, argument there brought by the railroad when the um, citizens were injured in that derailment in Minot, and in that case, there was a big preemption fight, and because of an amendment to the um, in 2007, <coughs> excuse me, to the FRSA, um, the court in that case found that preemption did not lie because preemption is a much more restrictive um, legal doctrine than what I think the railroad is arguing in this case. And so these are broad, sweeping arguments on preemption that um, I don't think fit in this context. So I've got a great deal of respect for Judge Leung, um, but there's always, uh, I guess, a question whether the facts and, and the legal question you know, fit these particular circumstances uh, identically. Um, so, Mr. Atkins, your response to Senator Kroon's question? Um, so, there's a lot to unpack there, but let, let me just, let me start with the withdrawal and its, and its ability to actually create negative preemption. And one place you can look for that, the source of that authority, first there's the Doyle case, which is a sort of a, a landmark case out of the Seventh Circuit that talks a great deal about negative preemption. But when the administration withdrew, withdrew the regulation, they had a section in their decision that spoke about the preemptive effect of that decision. So the idea that a, 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 an agency can't uh, preempt state regulations by withdrawing a rule is really contrary to not only the state of the law, but the intent that was in place at, at the time when the uh, Trump administration withdrew the proposed rule on two-person crews. The policy behind it is, is that once an agency has looked carefully at an, an issue, looked at the science and data, balanced the competing interests, and concluded that no regulation is required, that has the same effect as if they had decided to regulate. It, it, it precludes a state from coming in and stepping into what is perceived as a vacuum once the federal government decides that no regulation in that space is necessary. Now, to be candid, just to be, you know, the Trump's decision went up to the Ninth Circuit and got vacated. And so there is an open question about whether or not that particular negative, uh, that decision by the Trump administration to withdraw the rule mm -hmm. is a sufficient order to create negative preemption. But there are other decisions by FRA that have done the same thing. There's a 2009 decision where they, they said again that there was no science to support the regulation. There's been a series of other decisions in the crew space. But I would say that my, you know, my, my broadest takeaway is whether we disagree or agree about whether that negative preemption prevents the, the state from adopting this between now and nine months from now when the Biden administration acts, whatever the administration does at the end of this year, that will unequivocally preempt state laws, whether they adopt the proposed rule that they've got, whether they modify it in light of the public comment, and even if they withdraw it entirely, that would once again create the negative preemption that would preclude states from entering into this space. Uh, I, and I, I make. A, I know it's maybe it's a bit of a policy point, but just so you understand that the theory behind the preemption too, this is not just an economic issue. It's not about relieving the railroads of burdens. It's really it is a safety issue. 
so that uniformity promotes safety in the railroad space. So that if they need to comply with a single set of regulations, they can they can do so. But if they have to comply with with safety regulations that change and vary by state, by locality, that in and of itself can create safety problems for the railroads. And that's the type of issue that the FRA and DOT grapple with when they're trying to decide how to set that uniform national standard. I hope that answered your question, Senator. Senator Kroon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, is there any, was there any administrative action prior to the uh, 2016 notice of proposed rulemaking that would create negative preemption as well? Um, because you, you mentioned the issue of the, the withdrawal order being vacated by the Ninth Circuit. So could you revert back to before 2016 to create this negative preemption? No. Mr. Atkins. Chairman. Uh, yes. So there's a, uh, the first time this came to the FRA's attention in modern memory was in 2009 when the unions approached FRA and asked them to put in place regulations governing crew size. The FRA at the time said no, there is insufficient data to support any safety justification for that rule. So that's the first instance of ne negative uh, preemption or, or a, I don't want to call it negative preemption, it's the first instance where it's clear that they looked at this particular type of regulation and concluded it wasn't appropriate. Then you've got the whole 2016 to 2019. You've got other acts of FRA that do uh, speak to the crew size. So there's been safety advisories that FRA has issued that call upon the railroads to re-examine their crew size policies and make sure that they are safe and, in, and you know, so there's a safety component. And then there's a more elaborate risk reduction plan that FRA promulgated that all of the class one railroads have to put plans in place that are approved by FRA. One of the components of that is actually re-examining their, their crew size, their plans, how they, how they plan on, if they were inclined to move to less than two-person crews and maybe a ground-based conductor, how they would do that in a safe fashion. So that, that's, there's, so it's, it's not just one FRA safety regulation, it's a multitude of them uh, that we think in combination uh, are of the sort that would preempt uh, if we were, if we had to litigate that before uh, FRA and the Biden administration actually uh, promulgates its, its, its proposed rules. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, from going all the way back to my law school days, the one thing I went out of that of knowing about railroads is that they're federally regulated. And just from a broader standpoint, without getting into the nuts and bolts of the legal decisions and preemption and negative preemption, it does seem like this is something that should be regulated at the federal level. And that is particularly true in my view when we're talking about um, the fact that there is the notice of proposed rulemaking that is currently under advisement and that we're gonna get clarity on this soon. And it seems to me like there's gonna be express preemption or negative preemption if negative preemption doesn't already exist, which it sounds like it already does, but um, it just seems like why, why would we put our finger on the scale now in state law buying a sure lawsuit that's going to cost taxpayer dollar money to defend when this is all going to be decided in a matter of months? It just doesn't make sense to me for us to be doing it at this time in this session with what's going on. Um, and so, unless, you know, I guess one, unless the argument is that it could be withdrawn, but even then it seems like there's already negative preemption right now. There's going to be a lawsuit. This is, in my view, properly regulated by the federal government, and I just don't think it's something that we should be creating state law on right now. Well, members, uh, I'm actually reading Doyle <laughs> right now, and I'm honestly, uh, I could Mr. short circuit the Doyle decision um, Mr. Fuller. because in the Doyle decision, and it touches uh, Senator Kroon a little bit on some of the prior uh, arguments regarding the FRA's decisions 
and the lack of orders on a two-person crew or crew sizes. And in the Doyle decision, which is a Seventh Circuit case, I believe from 1999, it touches on um, three aspects of preemption. One of those involve a helper, and the other involves a hostler. And those are for activities that are in uh, rail yards. But the other part of the Doyle decision involves what we're talking about here, which is for over-the-road freight. And in that Doyle decision, it expressly held that the Wisconsin law on two-person crew for over-the-road freight was not preempted. And so that's why the railroad is here with um, the arguments trying to say that now there's this test in the Seventh Circuit for Doyle that requires um, negative preemption. And so the Doyle decision expressly held that a two-person crew was not preempted by federal law because there was an absence of um, federal regulation and a federal order. And so that's what we have here. Today, as we sit here before you, there is no federal law and there is no FRA order. And even as we just heard, any decisions on that have been withdrawn by the Ninth Circuit. And so I think it's important that our state regulates, um, and if it mirrors the federal law, that's fine, but at least there's not a gap where we're waiting as um, citizens who might be subjected to the safety concerns, where if the railroad decides and the FRA rule might be withdrawn by another administration, that if Minnesota is left without this bill, we have some serious safety concerns for the citizens. Um, and I think that's, again, another point why the effective date is so crucial. So um, th that's what I would have on that issue. Mr. So, Chair. members, here's, here's my analysis. Uh, Mr. Fuller is correct, at least according to the, uh, the case notes from West Publishing on the 1999 Doyle decision with regard to the over-the-road operations not being preempted by the FRA regulations. <clears throat> um, so to me, there's a bit of an open question, uh, perhaps on the legal issue, um, that I'm not prepared to have way one way or the other. Um, Mr. Chair. On this, this Senator Kroon. But the Doyle decision was issued in 1999, is that right? Yeah. The administrative action that they're talking about didn't pl take place till 2009. So the fact that Doyle in 1999 said that there was no federal preemption on that specific issue, I don't think that's the dispositive holding that we take from Doyle. I think it's more along the general lines that it's the dispositive thing is that the FRA considered it and decided whether to regulate it or not, and that creates the negative federal preemption. I, I guess so, maybe I should defer on that, but that's my reading of it. Chairman, if I, if I might just. Uh, honestly, I think I don't want to go any further with this, <laughs> this legal argument. Um, my conclusion is that there's some ambiguity about what the legal effect of the FRA's decision was. We won't know for sure until we get a Supreme Court decision evaluating something. Um, we're not going to have a federal, new federal rule on this for sure until maybe the end of this year or next year. So we're talking at least six months, maybe, maybe, maybe a year before there are any additional decisions. I'm not personally convinced with regard to this, the safety statistics that I haven't seen. I'm trying to think back to the conversations when this bill proposal was up several years ago, if I remember right, because there was some data floating around at that time, but I don't think that's really my decision to make on the Judiciary Committee today. That was transportation's decision. Um, it, it'll be my decision on the Senate floor, perhaps, but with regard to the provisions before the committee here today, um, I'm comfortable with the current structure of the, uh, the fines and the venue. I'm, I'm confident that can be sorted out. Um, I don't have any real problem with the uh, effective date um, if it's going to be effective, I'm not hearing any arguments that it can't be complied with within 30 days. I'm just hearing a question of, of uh, um, you know, timing relating to a federal rule. So I'm, I'm comfortable moving this bill on today as it is written to the Senate floor. I'd be interested in getting more information on the safety statistics that are being used to support the claim that a two-person crew is safer than a one-person crew in, in any situation. I'd like to know specifically in any situation other than a derailment. Yep. Um, we all know derailments are happening, <laughs> but um, I think that's 
kind of, to me, I'd like to have that information for a final policy decision, but I'm not prepared to undo the Transportation Committee's work on the merits of the two-person crew question. I think that was the committee's decision at this point. Um, so I'm going to support the bill as it is written with the caveats that I'm not sure what I'm going to do on the Senate floor because I want to learn a little bit more about the policy uh, for it. Um, but members, I'd, I'd like to wrap this conversation up. Is there any final thoughts from members of the committee and then Senator McEwen? Senator McEwen, any final thoughts here? Uh, I thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, um, members, for hearing this bill today. I also thank um, all of the testifiers for bringing this good, inf good information forward in the discussion about the preemption question. Um, I, for me, this really boils down to w that we are charged here with looking out for the people of our state, and this really does come down to a safety question for the people of Minnesota. Um, I understand that people have been working on this bill for some time and talking about this issue for some time. It, again, has, has been bipartisan in the past and it continues to be. And, and I thank you and, and again for, for hearing this and respectfully ask for your support as we move forward. And also, of course, if anyone has any issues they'd like to discuss with me about the bill going forward, um, my door is always open. I'd love to, to talk about them. All right. So, uh, Senator Umu Verbaten moves that Senate file 1417 uh, be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. See no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, motion prevails. All right. Thank you for the interesting discussion, members. <laughs> Thank I, you very I'm, much. I'm told that in years and years ago when the Senate Judiciary Committee was made up of a majority lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> Trouble. Um, including at least one or two then future members of the Minnesota Court of Appeals and at least one future county attorney, maybe more, that discussions like this used to go on until one or two o'clock in the morning. Oof. Um, I am not going to subject the committee to that. <laughs> Much as I would enjoy that discussion, we'll bring back the good old days. All right, members, uh, we're done with Senate File 1417 and Senator McKeon's appearances today. Thank you. Um, we have Senator Dibble here. Is he still here? <laughs> Senator Dibble, do you have a preference which order we take? Uh, we have, uh, looks like we've got our state patrol captain here on one of your bills. I don't know what you've got for witnesses on your other one. Um, so we, let's take up Senate file 1335, please. Policy changes relating to state patrol duties. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Mr. Elwood is here, but he's out in the hallway uh, on a phone call. So we'll uh, jump to the second bill first. I appreciate that. Um, Members, so, we're just uh, having jurisdiction over Section 3 on this bill. Correct. Just sir. so we can focus our presentation, Senator Dibble and Captain, and our committee discussion on Section 3, please. So, uh, so... Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, yes, uh, Section 3 is what brings this bill to judiciary, um, and it has to do with uh, when a person who um, operates, this ha uh, Mr. Chair, this has to do with uh, uh, school buses and uh, school bus repairs and, um, and uh, operating uh, school buses uh, after um, they have been notified that those repairs need to be made and the repair um, hasn't occurred and the um, bus continues to be operated uh, and that um, violation would create a gross misdemeanor. And we have, of course, a representative of the State Patrol who is responsible for this area who can speak more thoroughly to the proposal and the reason and the rationale for creating that crime. Captain Olson, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, my name is Captain John Olson with the Minnesota State Patrol, and uh, just to provide some context, uh, our commercial vehicle inspectors do approximately 20 plus thousand inspections a year uh, on school buses for the state of Minnesota. And what we're talking about here is a school bus that has been placed out of service for some critical safety defects, um, bad tires, inoperative brakes, those sorts of violations that really deem a school bus uh, completely unsafe to be operated on the road. Uh, and especially transporting our kids. Uh, 
there's been a few cases in recent history where we've had um, owners of these bus companies knowingly allow or require drivers to operate these out of service school buses before the vehicle violations have been fixed. Um, currently in law, it's a misdemeanor violation, and we hope that by making this a gross misdemeanor violation that these instances of these buses being used uh, can cease. All right. Members, is any other uh, testimony on this? I don't see any. Members, any questions or discussion? Seems we exhausted ourselves on the last <laughs> Senate file. Another gift from the... Uh, um, this great. does go back to transportation. Uh, I'm told mm -hmm. Senator Dibble, Senator Carlson uh, moves that Senate file 1335. Did you have a question? I have a, I have a question. Uh, go ahead, uh, Senator Carlson. Uh, I recall we talked about school bus uh, inspections many times over the years here, and uh, one of the more recent discussions we had was that just, there just wasn't enough inspectors. Is that still an issue? Is that a problem with getting them inspected on time or when requested or whatever the, uh, the nature of the schedule is, getting them inspected so that they're tempted to use them without, without being inspected and without being uh, repaired? Captain Olson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson, thanks for the question. Uh, at this time, when a, a bus is deemed out of service and fails our inspection, if the motor carrier has the ability to make those corrections, they can sign off on the inspection report and use that bus um, that they have verified those inspections without being in violation. So these are very, very specific cases where they have not made those repairs. And how are the resources you, for conducting inspections? You doing okay with number of staff and so on? Uh, Mr. Chair, we're working on that. Okay. Senator Dibble has a budget he might be able to help you with there. <laughs> Mr. Chair, we're working on that. <laughs> All right. So Senator Carlson moved that Senate File 1335 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Senate Transportation Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Captain. Made you wake a, wait an awful long time for that short presentation. But, uh, <laughs> thanks for your work. Uh, the other Senator Dibble uh, bill, Senate File 658. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. I think, and if I can confirm with counsel, what brings us to Judiciary Committee and Senate File uh, 658 is the judicial review, is that correct? Okay, so the judicial review aspect, um, which is found on line 3.19. Um, and just, I'll just give a very quick description of what the bill attempts to accomplish. Um, at present, uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, a ratepayer or a utility customer um, has the ability to bring a consumer complaint to the Consumer Affairs Office at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, if the finding is adverse, um, they really that's the end of the end of the line for them. There's really no opportunity to appeal unless they can find 49 other people with a similar complaint. Um, yes, uh, so. Um, so this, this is a matter of, of, of consumer affairs, uh, the ability for consumers, for utility customers to bring complaints to the Public Utilities Commission about uh, their utility service and some aspect of the utility service. If their complaint um, finding is adverse to their interest, that's the end of it for them, uh, unless they can find 49 other people and then petition for the Public, U Public Utilities Commission to take up the matter um, and so this allows for an individual to appeal the decision of the Consumer Affairs Office, um, uh, like almost, I think, not almost, I think every single other state has. Um, it also provides for the decision of the Public Utilities Commission to be a final decision, so then they would have uh, the opportunity to either appeal to um, administrative hearing um, I think that's the next step. They would go to the Office of Administrative Hearings. If that's a, um, an adverse decision, then they would have the right to access the courts. Um, and so that access to the courts um, is what brings us to this conversation today, Mr. Chair. Mr. Elwood is here um, to provide further information or let, me know, let us know if I got any of that wrong. 
Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Dibble, for bringing this. Um, I'm just happy to answer questions. This is a, uh, a, a bill that we brought to Senator Dibble. We've had some issues in the past about our utility consumers uh, who have had their, uh, threatened to have their utility service shut off and uh, got an adverse decision and we believe was uh, against the statute and there's really no place f for us to go. It's, we're in a legal cul-de-sac because the rules and the statutes conspire to basically say there is no appeal right to the commission. And as, and as uh, Senator Dibble said, um, the bill provides that if the commission then turns the consumer down, there's a judicial appeal and that's why we're here and happy to answer questions. And members, uh, you can take a look at the rest of the bill as well, but uh, just to put a little bit in context, I, th I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, but if you look on page one, section one, the statute is reproduced that uh, identifies the, the kinds of grievances that uh, a consumer could bring in such a complaint. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the uh, the procedures by which those grievances could be heard in a complaint. And then the remedy being sought here is that there's a dead end at the end of the commission's decision without any statutory grounds for review of the commission's decision in a, uh, in a court. Am I understanding that correctly, Mr. Slight, it, current, the current state of affairs is even slightly worse than you just described. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the final decision at this point would be at the Consumer Affairs Office. There's no real right of appeal, no practical right of appeal even to the Public Utilities Commission itself at that point unless you can put together a class of 50. So if an individual had one complaint, hmm. not 50 people, but one that affected that individual and may have only affected that individual, Right now, that individual's route to have its grievance determined favorably ends at the Consumer Affairs Division or Office of the Public Utilities Commission? That is correct, Mr. Chair. And is this before or after the, does a full Public Utilities Commission have a decision-making role in this process somewhere? Mr. Chair, no. This would be a staff administrative level decision. So someone brings a grievance, they go through the, or a complaint, they go through the process. It, there's some decision, even though it's stated in the terminology, the commission's receipt of an appeal. What really happens is they have a division, a consumer affairs division of sorts, that either dismisses, I suppose, in the name of the Public Utilities Commission. No, not even in the name of, because the statute, well, the language here is referring to the commission's receipt. Mr. Chair, if I can clarify. Mr. Elwood. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, so the way it works now is if um, I'm a consumer, the utility threatens to shut me off, I go to the Consumer Affairs Office. Consumer Affairs, I claim a violation of law, tariff, rule. Consumer Affairs Office says I don't, fine for you, sorry, the utility can shut you off. That's it for me. I cannot, under the current statute, I have no right, unlike every other consumer of every other public utilities commission in America, I have no right then to go above the staff level, the informal complaint level, to the commission itself and have that, that adjudicated at that level. So what you're uh, establishing or attempting to establish in this bill is that right to go beyond that staff level uh, ultimately to an, an administrative Office of Administrative Hearings ALJ determination, and then after that to the court? Mr. Chair, not necessarily. The commission has three options when they hear today, if not a, an individual consumer complaint, but a complaint by the utility against another utility, against the, the Commerce Department against the utility. They have three options. What about right? the individual? This bill is targeting individual. Yeah, the individual has right? no option, Mr. Chair and members. They have no option once the the lower staff turns them down. And Mr. Elwood, what's the route that is proposed in this bill for that individual complaint? 
Mr. Chair, members, the, the uh, route would be that the, they would make an appeal then of the lower staff's decision to the full commission. The commission can do one of three things. The commission could then dismiss for lack of merit, could hold a formal proceeding on its own motion, or can send it to a contested case at the, at the administrative uh, uh, before administrative law judge. So what you're proposing to do is whichever of those ends up in a final decision, um, if, if it's the dismissal for no reasonable basis or it's resolved through the commission's own proceeding, they can go straight to judicial review in district court. If it's an OAH decision, then they're judicial review of that is governed by chapter 14. Mr. Chair, members, that is precisely correct. But it does provide a route then for an individual get it, to get into a court um, should they choose to do so. And that's Mi the point yeah. of this bill? Mr. Chair, yes. All right. Um, and so what specifically brought it to us is the fact that there's a judicial review route at the end um, and uh, and so that's why we're considering. Okay, thank you for the clarity on that. Um, any questions or discussion from members of the committee? Not seeing any. Everyone is, Mr. Chair, still exhausted from <laughs> the other bill I sent you. Let's from move transportation. quickly then. Uh, <laughs> Senator Westland uh, um, moves that, that Senate File 658 be recommended to pass and be uh, re-referred to the Committee on Utilities, Environment, and Climate. So moved. All those Mr. in favor Chair. say aye. Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Dibble. We, we started, uh, are we going, having to go back there? We've That's already been I'm, there. We are told to be re-referred there. Uh, apparently there is, there is a fiscal note oh, okay. and it's not our budget. I see, all right, very good. Well, I'll go ask Senator Friends to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on uh, Senator Westland's motion um, that uh, Senate File 658 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Utilities, Environment, and Climate, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Members, we're going to take up Senate File 2597 at this time, a, stand, a petition for post-conviction relief. It's my bill, so I'm going to give the gavel to Senator Remove Verbatim. Senator Latz, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, uh, Senate File 2597 has to do with post-conviction release uh, or relief petitions. Um, under current law, under current statute, a person who um, is uh, convicted uh, has an opportunity under certain circumstances to go back to the district court and ask for relief. Uh, one of those grounds um, is if they allege that they have, uh, there exists newly discovered evidence, including scientific evidence, uh, that uh, could not have been ascertained by the exercise of due diligence um, within the two-year time period for filing a post-conviction petition. So most post-conviction relief petitions are uh, limited or not available after two years. Um, the proposal... Uh, current statute does provide an exception to that two-year statute of limitations if there's newly discovered evidence. This bill proposes to clarify uh, uh, some of the 
that exception. And I'm going to ask Mr. Marquardt to go into more detail about that. Mr. Marquardt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, happy to be here uh, testifying in support of Senate File 2597. My name is Andrew Marquardt. I am a managing attorney at Great North Innocence Project. Um, so in, in most cases, most of the time, our criminal justice system does a reasonably good job making sure that if we're going to lock someone up in prison, we're confident we have the right guy. But not always. And there have been nearly 3,300 exonerations, known exonerations in the U.S. since 1989. Um, so we know that sometimes the system gets it wrong, sometimes grievously wrong. So we need to have a robust system of, for post-conviction relief for these cases where new evidence calls the integrity of a conviction into question. And sometimes that evidence that supports a claim for no fault of the defendant doesn't arise until years later. Uh, and the most basic premise of this bill is that uh, when that evidence does arise, uh, if it supports a valid claim for relief, that defendant should get their day in court. They should get a chance to prove their case. Um, so uh, Senator Latz accurately described the state of the current law. Uh, the, the, the basic problem with this, this exception for based on newly discovered evidence is that it sets uh, the bar unreasonably high just to get back into court. So you, right now you have to show, among other things, which this bill doesn't change, which it leaves in place, you have to show, establish by a clear and convincing standard that the petitioner is innocent of the offense or offenses for which the petitioner was convicted. So the lawyers will know that is a very high bar. And remember, we're just talking about getting back into court. This is not to go home. This is just to get back in court. And it, it works for some cases. If you have DNA, that kind of works. But most cases don't have DNA. You know, most cases are built more upon a mosaic of small pieces of information. Um, and in those cases, often they just don't lend themselves to that kind of overwhelming affirmative proof of innocence. And those people are left out in, out in the cold under the current standard. Uh, one of those people is our client, Thomas Rhodes. He was uh, wrongfully convicted of murdering his wife, spent 25 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Uh, back in 2014, we had compelling evidence that, um, that would have undone the state's case, thoroughly discredited key evidence. But the state Supreme Court said that's not enough under this language because you can't just undo the state's case, you gotta affirmatively prove your innocence. Again, just to get back in court. So he, you know, fortunately, he was released this year through the uh, Conviction Review Unit of the Attorney General's office. But I, I would submit that this language cost him probably about eight years of his life. And that's the kind of injustice we're trying to avoid going forward. Um, so, uh, you know, I would just note Minnesota law is really an outlier on this issue. Uh, we have one of the most restrictive standards in terms of bringing untimely, newly discovered evidence claims in the country. I'm litigating a case like this in Mississippi. The Mississippi standard is less restrictive than ours. It's easier for me to uh, litigate a newly discovered evidence claim in Mississippi than it is in Minnesota. Uh, we have the most restrictive standard in the Midwest. Actually, I brought a demonstrative. Um, with the, uh, the Midwest states and the federal standard kind of ranked on a spectrum here from least restrictive over on the left to most restrictive on the right. Over here, these are states that don't even have a statute of limitations for post-conviction. But um, the rest of the states and the federal system do. No other jurisdiction in the Midwest requires this clear and convincing standard of innocence in order to get back into court. We're the only ones. And so our bill, if you kind of boil it down to its essence, we're basically trying to take Minnesota from the far right over here, tuck it in right around South Dakota. So, you know, I, I practice in South Dakota. I, I love South Dakota. South Dakota is not known for being overly uh, solicitous of criminal defendants' rights. This is not a radical proposal. This is just trying to bring Minnesota into the mainstream on this issue. Um, and allow for relief where it's merited. I want to address one concern. Um, you know, I think there's a concern, well, will this lead to more frivolous litigation? I think the answer is no. Um, you know, the concern there on, is really with pro se litigants, people who are unrepresented. Um, those folks will usually bring their claims basically no matter what the legal standard is. 
the, the real concern is, you know, are these cases going to an evidentiary hearing where you're, that's where the, the really significant burden kicks in. And what you'll find is if you look at the pro se cases that are getting kicked out under this standard, overwhelmingly, almost all of them have multiple defects. This is not the only defect. So those cases are not going to go to evidentiary hearings even with this change. The ones that are going to go are the ones that should, the ones where you have real new evidence, and that evidence provides a basis for a facially valid claim for relief. And those people are, are the ones who uh, are left out under a current system and should have an opportunity to, to, to pursue justice. So I hope you'll support the bill, and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Marquardt. Members, questions? Okay, Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 2597 be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. Uh, Senator Latz moves that Senate File 2597 be recommended to pass and referred to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's adopted. Thank you. And we are going to move to Senate File 1279. Senator Carlson will be uh, testifying. Senator Carlson, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members, I'm uh, sitting in here for Senator Erin May Quaid. Uh, she has uh, nicely uh, permitted me to present this bill. Uh, I've had it in the past, and uh, so I'm kind of familiar with it. But there's a lot of uh, good information, new information, and uh, I want to I want to uh, ask for your support here. Uh, Senate File 1279 repeals the current law governing an adopted person's access to original birth records and creates a new process for an adopted person who is at least 18 years old. That's, they're an adult now to access their original birth records. If an adopted person is deceased, the adopted person's spouse, child, or grandchild may access the records in the same manner. This bill provides that all, con that all consents to disclosure and affidavits of non-disclosure are unenforceable after June 30th, 2022, and creates a contact preference form for birth parents. Um, it rec this, the bill recognizes that uh, Minnesota law controlling access to adult adopted persons' original birth record is overly complex, uh, inequitable, and to the adult adopted people, it no longer reflects today's reality where genetics and genealogy of humans cannot be kept secret. Um, what if you didn't know who your birth parents are? I don't know if any of you sitting at the, at the uh, table here don't know your birth parents, but I know some people that didn't, have never known their birth parents and that has always been pressure on them. And if you uh, talk about this bill to just a random person, you might find out that this is a lot of pressure on them. 15 minutes ago, I was on the phone with my, uh, my car insurance agent, and I said I had to go to the judiciary and present this bill. And she said, Jim, did you know I was adopted? 
And so she is, you know, this is what happens is people don't, you know, they know they're adopted, but they can't get the true story. And what happens is they really don't know all their background of who they are. So this amends section 144.2252 so that the adult uh, adopted person, this is an adult adopted person, and his or her descendants or spouse may request and obtain a copy of the adopted person's original birth record. It does provide birth parents the option to file a compact a contact presser, sorry, a contact preference form that inform the adult adopted person of the birth parent's wishes concerning contact, contact directly through an intermediary or preference for no contact at all. It sunsets the laws that previously uh, filed birth to parent consents to disclosure or affidavits of non-disclosure uh, effective July 1st, 2023. It repeals a, uh, the statute which governs a complex and largely broken procedure currently used when an adult adopted person requests his or her own birth, birth record with the Minnesota Department of Health. One important thing is that if a person is, uh, is given up by their, by their parent or parents, and placed into the uh, adoption, and if they're not adopted, they go into the foster child uh, system, and they always have access to their adoption records and their birth certificate. So this, uh, this system should be fair to all people, and an adult should have the right to go into their own history and find out who they really are. So with that, I have some testifiers here, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I have your, I do have Mr. Lucas's Lewis. name here. Lewis, yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure who's going first right now. I will. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, and I Mr. Think Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I believe there may be an amendment as well that I just want to make sure we're working up this, the right. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry, I do have an author's amendment. Uh, would you like to offer the amendment? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I offer the uh, A2 amendment to Senate File 1279. Thank you, and this is an author's amendment. All those in favor of the A2 amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the amendment's adopted. Uh, Mr. Luce. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Gregory Luce. I'm here personally and as an attorney with the Adoptee Rights Law Center. I am considered a national expert on the issue raised by Senate File 1279. I'm also an adopted person, a father of two, and a longtime Minnesota resident. Senate file 1279 is about one piece of paper, an adult adopted person's original birth certificate. It is not about adoption agency records or court adoption records or about open versus closed adoptions. It is also not about a promise of anonymity, which is an impossible promise to make or enforce. It is about a human right as adults to know who you are and where you came from. To date, more than 100,000 people across the country have received in their mail their own original birth records. Adopted people in Alabama have for the past 20 years requested their own birth records, and in a few weeks, they receive a copy of it in the mail. In the past three years, more than 20,000 New York adoptees have done this. Just this past year, the rights of Louisiana-born adopted people have been restored, and they are now receiving their own records without restrictions. This is the same for other states, including Connecticut, Oregon, Alaska, and Kansas, and will be soon for Vermont, South Dakota, and likely Georgia. And with all of these states, no issues have been reported other than how long it may take to get your birth record in the mail. These laws work, and they are necessary because they are about the autonomy and equality of all people, specifically adopted people like me. In the diverse states that have restored a right that Minnesotans once also possessed, the world has not fallen apart, adoption has not suffered, and lives have not been ruined. Providing a birth record privately and directly to the adult named on it becomes a simple, meaningful, uh, and powerful acknowledgement of who we are. And the myths, the secrets, the shame embedded into our adoptions long ago are at least addressed truthfully and fully in a way that most people are entrusted to do, except for us. 
That is, the people involved directly in this issue are those best able to deal with their own truths honestly and privately. That's what this bill does. It takes a Byzantine law and distills it down to a single piece of paper that is ours. Nothing more, nothing less. We ask for your support of Senate File 1279. And I'm open to any questions on the substance of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luce. Um, up next, we have Penelope Needham. Let me know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If you could state your name and title for the record when you begin. Madam Chair and members, my name is Penelope Needham and I am here representing adult adoptees and also the Minnesota Coalition for Adoption Reform, which includes adoptees, birth parents, and adoptive parents. I was born, adopted, and raised in Minnesota. I am a teacher, a facilitator of support groups for adoptees, and a member of the Coalition for Adoption Reform, Minnesota. Senate File 1279 will help thousands of people who were born in Minnesota and adopted as children. The bill restores the right of adopted adult persons to receive, upon request, a government document, their own original birth certificate. Prior to 1939, adoptees were able to get their own birth certificates upon request. And second, this bill removes the parental permission requirement for adoptees who are adults. I don't think any other law in Minnesota requires adults to have parental permission to receive a government document with, with, in which they are the subject. DNA databases now make it possible to identify birth relatives, but the contact preference form included in this bill is a direct and personal way for a birth parent to share their preferences regarding contact with their relinquished child, now an adult. Not every adult adoptee will want their birth certificate. I did. I wanted to see and hold the piece of paper that recorded the name I was given at birth, my parents' names, the time and place I was born, and other facts contained in, in the document. Like many other adoptees, I experienced a kind of healing for the losses created by my relinquishment and adoption. It is time to change this old law and restore the rights of adults who were adopted as children to request and receive their own original birth certificate without parental permission, just like everyone else. Thank you. I hope you will support this bill as introduced, Senate File 1279. Thank you for your testimony. And next, we'll go to Jacqueline Steele. Thank you. Madam Chair and members of this committee, my name is Jacqueline Steele, and I am representing Concerned United Birth Parent as I am a birth parent. In 1968, I became a birth parent when I gave birth to my daughter and relinquished her for adoption. I still hear my mother's voice saying to me, if you come home with that baby, I will kill you both. My mother was very mentally challenged, and that has been a fear that I have carried for myself and my daughter all these years. I have been a member of the national and state organizations of Concerned United Birth Parents, or CUB, since 2009. Our Minnesota chapter was formed in 1976 and has been active since then in welcoming birth parents, adoptees, and adoptive parents to our monthly meetings. My reason for being here today is not so much to talk about my story, well, maybe a little, but to talk about the people that are on the either side of me, Greg's story, Penny's story, and my daughter's story. I'm not exactly sure who thought it was a good idea to withhold original birth certificates, documents we all treasure from the people that we cherish the most, adoptees, our adopted sons and daughters. This piece of paper belongs to them without reservation, hesitation, and principle. Why? Because it's theirs and theirs 
alone, period. It's their business, not mine and not yours. Senate File 1279 affords them the most confidential way of obtaining that document. The procedure is private and simple. Walk to the counter, request the certificate, pay your fee, walk away with a piece of paper, the OBC, and go celebrate your victory. Now, that's a story, and a story that you all want to be able to tell your children and your adopted children that you were a part of, that you made it happen. It's private, no internet, and no BS. It's the real deal, and it's about time. Thank you so very much for allowing me to speak today, for hearing this testimony. Thank you for your service to the state of Minnesota. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you to all of you. If, if you would um, just stay nearby, I'm going to ask Senator Carlson to come forward, and then if we have any questions, we'll call you back up. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee members, questions, comments? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Carlson, do you remember, don't we have an opportunity uh, going back to a specific date that original birth records are available, um, a certain date or year going forward that they are available and that there is a time before that date that they are not. Senator um, Carlson. Can you tell me what the present status is? Senator Glimmer, yes, there is a date, and I think Mr. Mr. Luce can probably give you the, the best response on that question. Mr. Luce. Right. In 1977, Minnesota became the first state in the country to create a, a very complex um, Byzantine um, process in which you could request your birth record. But um, it was not available unless you met um, all sorts of different conditions, one of which was if the birth parent had consented to it, you might be able to get it. But um, if there was nothing on file, which was typically the case, then you would have to contact the agency. The agency would do a search to try to find a birth parent to determine what the birth parent believes should happen. And typically, that did not lead to anything. And so it's, that's part of the complex system that we still have today. But it was 1977 was the year. So, Senator um, Lemmer. Thank you. Um, so uh, in 1977, going forward, anyone could request a birth certificate from that year or date forward. Madam, Mr. Luce. Madam Chair, Madam Chair um, Senator Lemmer, um, you could request a birth certificate since 1917. Um, they weren't sealed until 1939. Okay. In uh, 1977, um, Senator Alan Speer brought a bill, actually, at that point, in which they'd created this process in which you um, had to go through this process in order to get the birth record. But it's not one that these other states have now um, more recently been implementing, and that is you go to, or you mail in your application, you pay a fee, and in a few weeks you, you receive sure. it. Yeah. Senator Lummer. Uh, this has been before us off and on in years past. And um, I always have to recite uh, the story of a woman who called me during one of those times. And uh, I recognize some of the people in the room. I'm sorry I have to bring this up again, but we do have to talk about the parents that, or the mother that in an earlier time wanted her identity sealed. And she was promised that during that era. And uh, I had a woman call me. She went to my church. She said, uh, she said Warren, uh, you know who I am, and I'm not going to tell you who I am. If I had a child out of wedlock, and if my husband knew that now, he would divorce me. And 
this bill would open that opportunity up. And I can only think back during that era, that was an era where there was a, a different attitude toward women, the relationship they have with their families, certainly a different expectation by husbands. Um, that was in the 70s and earlier, all the way back to 1939. Uh, at that time, there was no, uh, well, birth control had come in in the early 60s, but you didn't have the, the uh, pregnancy counseling, you didn't have abortion, you didn't have uh, battered women's shelters. And if a, if a woman was pregnant and expecting that was out of wedlock, oftentimes to, to avoid the stigma, they would be moved out of town, live with uh, uncle or aunt somewhere. And I'm concerned about that era, that woman that was promised that her name would be sealed and that she would never reveal or have revealed against her wishes um, her identity. And so in 1977, uh, the legislature made kind of a compromise. They said, attitudes are changing. We think we can move forward now. And they uh, tried to make this kind of a cutoff where birth certificates, original birth certificates could be uh, revealed going forward. And at that time, uh, uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune endorsed that idea. Uh, you had the ACLU endorse it. You had MCCL endorse it. You had the Lutheran Social Services endorse it. And from that point forward, it's kind of, despite its complexity, at least that era, that generation of women that didn't want their identity revealed was held sacrosanct by the state of Minnesota. This bill would change that. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about, um, in particular, the woman who called me, um, but I'm sure there are others of that era that are still around. And I know that we live in, an, in a time where you have technology that the internet, you can pretty much find just about anybody. Um, the technology is here to do things. Uh, the uh, opportunity to identify and maybe send a, a message to the mother asking if they can open their, their arms a little bit to uh, receive a message from a child, a grown child, uh, is available. Um, what do you say about that woman that was promised years ago? Quite honestly, I think promises made to those women should be promises kept. So there is another side to this that we haven't talked about. And as I said, I'm sorry to bring it up. I brought it up before over other debates, but it is something I have to do to represent those other women in this equation. Hey, Madam Chair. Mr. Luce. Madam Chair, um, Senator Limmer, um, this is what we call the what about question. We get it a lot um, about all the what abouts about how complicated adoption is. Um, and it's a good question um, and one that I take seriously. Um, as that could be my mother or it could be Penny's mother. But it's also a rarity on this issue, the, the call or the, the young woman you talk to or the older woman you talk to. Especially as the letters that are in the packets from these three groups, Cub, uh, Cub which um, Jackie is part of, uh, concerning United Birth Parents, uh, the Catholic Mothers for Truth and Transparency, and Mothers um, for Open Records Everywhere. 1,400, 1,500 signatures on those letters saying, we did not want protection, and we consider it an extension of the shame we endured back in those days um, to not allow our children to have those records. They also want to be found discreetly and privately, and that's really important. I'm going to get to that in a second. And three, they all support this bill. 
And so I think if we need to listen to the voices of birth parents, this is a classic example where they have organized themselves and have been asked to be heard. Uh, and we, we can't address every question that comes up uh, as, uh, as a what about question. Um, there's always going to be a story that we can't really address. But when, I, when we go back to the, the woman that you talked to, this current bill, if enacted, would provide her much more protection than current law. Uh, as illustrated by when I, you know, one of the packets has this illustration of what happens when you incentivize DNA, and this is what happens. Um, it makes the idea or concept of privacy, which is distinct from anonymity, worse for everyone. And I not only witness this every day in, in my own work in representing adult adopted people, but it also informs what I have to do for my clients to assure privacy for everybody not only a biological relative, but also adopted people like me. We have privacy rights as well, and birth parents can easily find us as well. But we're not asking for that kind of protection. But when I petition the court in Minnesota, and this is generally how you have to do it in Minnesota, which is only the way to get your birth record, I lay out what DNA testing has already shown, explaining the number of matches with first cousins, second cousins, maybe an uncle, and we may have a search angel involved. And I lay this out to the court, and I say to the court, we can go down this line of asking all these people in this family, do you know someone in the family who gave up a child for adoption in 1968? And the uncle talks to a brother. The brother says, I think that might have been Sheila. Sheila says, no, that's not me. It might be my cousin. And that concern about being found out is spread across an entire family line maybe even generations. So this bill is structured so it, it does have the ability of those birth parents who are concerned to have the agency to take action, and that is to, con uh, to file a contact preference form. And that's an important piece of information for an adopted person to know, to say, to get a form from a birth parent that says, I'd like to be contacted, which is the vast majority of what birth parents want. Or I'd like to be contacted, but please, I'd like to go through an intermediary, and here's the intermediary. Or three, please, I do not want to be contacted. And that's that. And that, that's important information for the adopted person to have, but they're not going to get that in a system using DNA. They're just going to make, this is gonna, in order to find out, I just identify, not even to contact, identify who gave birth to them in 1968, they have to go through this system and identify her throughout the entire family. So this bill does protect that woman much more carefully than the current law. And I think when a promise is no longer uh, a good promise, you need to redo it to make it better. Senator Blumer. Um, in your uh, hypothetical, you, you created this scenario where you'd basically tiptoe into distant relatives and start probing. Um, that triggers a lot of discussion in a family. Little buzz going on back and forth over cell phones. And who do you think it was? Right. Oh, it might have been. No, it couldn't have been her. Oh, it, maybe it was somebody else. Well, that too, I would tend to think, is uh, an invasion of privacy as well. Because it starts the probes within the family. Maybe no one knows. But they start cross-examining quietly scratching their heads, and uh, eventually, uh, by a process of elimination, they kind of narrow the field, and then that privacy is, is opened up. Um, I'm not sure if that DNA process is really, uh, well, to me, I could see where it could, it could be discreet, or it could be very harsh um, in that process. Um, you know, uh, where I come from, a promise is a promise. Uh, you're trying to define it as a not-so-good promise. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it would probably be hard for me to determine the quality of a pro pro promise if I wasn't the subject of the promise. And so um, for that reason, I can't support the bill. And... Um, I think it's, 
I think this bill will, when passed into law, if it goes that far, it's going to keep some women up at night wondering when the shoe's going to drop, when the next phone call is going to happen, and, and their secret will be revealed, despite the fact that they were promised uh, that that wouldn't ever be revealed. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to the, to the children that uh, experience this, but um, I still have to recognize the other side of the equation. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Lewis. Real quick, because I know you're <clears throat> late in the day. Uh, I agree with you completely that DNA and using DNA is not discreet at all. And that's the, but that's the only tool we have. And if that's the only tool we have, we're going to use it. What we're creating here is a bill that allows much more privacy. And if the woman is staying up at night worrying about this, I hope she hears about this bill when it's law and can take that action of filing a contact preference form so she should yeah. tell. I would agree. Yeah. I would and so agree. I think that's the system we want. Thank you. I'm going to go to Senator, Senator Westland. Okay. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I guess I want to say something, you know, and we have talked about this before, and, and that uh, uh, even, even some mothers, or let's say uh, birth mothers, have been threatened uh, by their boyfriends or something else, you know, and if, uh, uh, if they're fearful, first of all, if they know the, uh, the birth father and uh, they're threatened, uh, they should, you know, notify law enforcement. But uh, also, if they're afraid, if they're just afraid, and if you hear from them that they're afraid and that they, you know, they don't want to go through this personally, they should be advised to file a preference form. Because if they file that preference form, that's the end of that contact. They won't be, they won't be contacted by that person that is seeking seeking their birth certificate. And uh, you know, that's I think I think we need to be sure that we look at. What is the right of you to know your, your birth parents and where you come from, who you are? Uh, and then also, if uh, sometimes the birth parents want to be uh, found, they want to see someone that looks like them, or the adoptee wants to see someone that looks like my grandma. Uh, so there's a lot of pe people on the other on that side of the uh, of the issue that are desiring desiring it, and I think we need to respect the r rights that they have to know who they are, especially when they get to be an adult. So when they're an adult, uh, and when we talk about the uh, promises, that I will have to say that the promises that were made were by these. Some of them were just social agencies that really didn't have the authority to promise the state uh, you know, would keep them secret. They, they, their organization can keep them secret, but they didn't have the authority from the legislature. And what we're looking at is we're looking at having the right of the adult be recognized so that they can get this, uh, this document that is kept by the state. So Madam Chair. Senator Lumer. Uh, so what authority was created in 1939? It, well, in 19, Mr. Luce. Uh, thank you, Ma Madam Chair, uh, Senator Limmer. In 1939, uh, for the first year, they sealed uh, original birth records and made them unavailable to the, even to the adult later. Always, um, the sealing of records has been interlinked with illegitimate births. It all started with you know, pr trying to prevent the stigma of illegitimate births being more public. So, in 1939, following California, New York, the District of Columbia, Minnesota got onto that bandwagon. But they over they overreached. They hadn't thought about adoptees actually becoming adults, and that's what we're dealing with now, a couple of generations later. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I'm not going to. This will be very quick. And um, I spoke with you in my office, and I. I brought up the, the the form that can be filed because it seems like I understand the technology argument passing by kind of the statutes and people are kind of just doing it anyway through DNA testing. I would I would hope that the form, whatever um, is allowed by the birth parent to be filed, 
could have an opportunity to elaborate on some of these unique cir circumstances and it's not just three boxes and that's it. Because maybe there are special occasions like really this is what's going on, mm -hmm. I really don't want to be contacted for this specific reason and that the birth parent would have an opportunity to elaborate a little bit on this form so that the adoptee can kind of see that and have a better understanding about why they don't want to be contacted and hopefully they would honor that. Um, but regardless of whether the law passes and regardless of whether they want to honor that or not, I guess right now they, it seems like there's enough tools for them to not honor it if they didn't want to. But hopefully, my guess is the vast majority of adoptees would honor that. Um, and so that's just my comment. I don't think we need to legislate that, put it into the statute or anything, but that would be my comment that I hope that there would be an opportunity for birth parents to elaborate on the form that gets filed. Madam Chair, may I? Uh, yes. Um, I think talking about the other side, of which I am the other side, um, I'm very grateful to have gotten some good genes from my parents. My next birthday is birthday 77. And I wanted my family to understand. And instead of hiding, um, my mother didn't tell my father or my brother for 15 years. And then when she did, all hell broke loose. And as I said, she was very mentally challenged. And that is why I was so concerned about that for myself, for my brother, for my daughter. There has to come a time when people are willing to take a look at the reality of life. And that is true, that if you want to find somebody, you can find them. And if you don't want to be found, I guess you can go to the basement and stay there for the rest of your life, but that would not be my choice. Getting involved with knowing adoptees, getting involved with concerned United Birth Parents, going to their conferences, hearing wonderful stories from people who have survived all this. And I guess I would like to raise my hand and say, I think I have survived this. This is another piece of it to think about. It isn't about only the adoptee. It's about the whole triad. And that's the really important part. So as you're thinking about this, please take that into consideration. It is of utmost importance to all human beings concerned. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Jill. Madam Mr. Lewis. Just one real quick, and I want to respond to Senator Kroon, Madam Chair, Senator Kroon. I, I, that, that was a great conversation that we had in your office, and I've taken it back with me. Um, and I did mention that Vermont did something very similar to that uh, in just passing their law last year. I could just read you what it had, and we can talk more about maybe we can get this into the next uh, amendment if it goes to HHS, which I think is where it's scheduled to go. And that is, a contact preference form shall include space where the person may include information that the parent feels is important for the adopted person to know. And so I, I will take that with us, and I appreciate your, your uh, contribution to that. Thank you. Senator Latz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I might have... I stepped out, so you might have already covered this, but I just have a question or two real quickly. This uh, <clears throat> contact preference form, um, if, if it were filed by a mother who gave up a child for adoption and did not want contact, uh, would, the, uh, th would the adoptee still have access to the birth record and knowledge of who the mother is? Yes, it's Mr. Lewis, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator uh, Latz. Uh, yes, it is a, what we call the non-binding contact preference form. Okay, so Madam Chair, Senator Latz. Uh, so, um, so the information would be shared, and it would be basically a discretionary decision on the part of the adoptee whether they wished to honor the contact preference of the mother that gave the child up for adoption, right? Mr. Lewis. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Lett, yes, it would be a matter of discretion. I will say by, from my experience, and I've dealt with hundreds if not thousands of adopt, adult adopted people, it's an excruciating decision whether to contact a birth parent or not. And because 
there is something called uh, secondary rejection is one of those reasons, because you're, you're going to get rejected by this birth parent. And, and so, and we also think, and so do birth parents believe, we don't want to intrude on someone's life and, and mess up their life. So it is a very excruciating decision, although I don't know how we legislate. Tennessee did try a no contact provision. It did not work, and they've repealed it two years ago. So that's the only state that's tried that. Um, and it did not work. I don't know how to legislate that other than we get all the information that we need and an adopted person makes a decision. Senator Latt. So I'm, I'm drawing an inference from your comments then that there is no, uh, there is no provision in the bill for an adoptee uh, that says they must or in some way honor that contact preference of the birth parent, uh, let alone any consequences if they choose to disregard that contact preference and, for Mr. example, Luce. contact the birth parent against the birth parent's wishes, right? Mr. Luce. Madam Chair, Senator Letts. Uh, yes, but I think that current law would certainly take care of if, you know, and, and this is really happy thought because I've, I've not heard of this, but if a adoptee contacted a birth parent and a birth parent says, please, I, I do not want to be contacted. If you contact me again, I will either hire an attorney or seek some sort of civil remedy or criminal remedy, depending upon the circumstances. That's still there. That right to privacy is still there. Um, again, it's a, it's a pure hypothetical. It's nothing that I've ever come across. No, I think the issue would Senator be, Madam Chair, I think the issue would be the whether or not the initial contact is made in the first place against the wishes of the of the birth parent. All right. Thank you for filling in those factual gaps for me. I appreciate it. Any final words, Senator Carlson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It is, like Mr. Lou said, it can be a, a very serious decision for a birth parent to uh, reject someone they know is their their birth child, or to uh, even accept them, uh, and I think that uh, at least I've heard of enough positive instances that make me strongly support this. I think it's it's a good thing. Now, uh, you know, we won't we don't need to go into the one the ones that are a little uncomfortable. For instance, you find out your your sister is really your mother. And I know of an instance like that. Um, so there's, there are things that are uncomfortable, but you know, really, I think we need to, we need to be upfront with who we are, and who we're related to, who our ancestors are, and then you know, make sure that our descendants know who they are also. So I support this strongly, and I, I, uh, if if we're ready, I would like to move Senate File 1279. Yes. Um, I'm going to go to Senator Latz before the, the final motion. Fine. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm going to step on the, uh, the stand-in chief author's uh, final remarks, but um, <clears throat> there's an analogy here, and I'm not quite sure how well it works, and I'm struggling with the concept. I'm going to support moving the bill on, but I'm struggling with the concept because, uh, you know, people who are gay and don't want someone else to out them they want to be empowered to make that decision on their own, uh, might resent being outed, even if five years later they've made peace with it and they're flourishing, they might still resent that. And, and maybe that's a, to me, that's a decision that they ought to be able to make for themselves. And the DNA stuff is not just about finding out who your birth parent is. You might find out that... Um, someone you thought was your sister is really your mother, you might find out that the, re the revered uncle or that your father had an affair and had a child by someone else who is now living in some other town and it may end up breaking up marriages and, and everything like that. I mean, there was a long story I listened to on the radio about a Harvard geneticist who went through the genetic process himself and understood all of the scientific details about it. Um, and it was it was incredibly disruptive to multiple prongs of his family once the DNA data become, became known and the family tree got rewritten. Um, so 
I'm really concerned about the ancillary or the, 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 the ancillary impacts of something like this. And um, I got to think this through a little bit. As I say, I'm going to support moving this on, but this is this is not an easy thing to think about. Uh, no matter how much I would like to honor the desires of a an adoptee to find out more about their birth mother for a whole variety of reasons. Um, I guess I have to think about in whose power should we place that decision. Um, so that's where I'm kind of struggling. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, just briefly, Senator Limmer. In the bill, uh, or one of the testifiers said that if a woman wanted to check a box that said, no way, do I ever want to be uh, contacted? Uh, how, would, how would that particular woman know? What's the notice? How would she know that there's even a form or a duty for her to perform to put an X in that box according to this bill? Because quite honestly, I don't see that. And so if you don't check the box, I guess you're open game. And so um, uh, how, would we, how would we inform? How, how do we do that? Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Ms. Steele. Um, Senator, there are, there are many ways that people can choose to be quiet and hide and other ways that are very helpful to them to become um, not hating themselves, not going to the nth degree of trying to figure out how are they going to live with this story for the rest of their life. And it's one of the reasons why we have the groups that we have. Concerned United Birth Parents, I would recommend and I would highly recommend and invite any one of you who wants to attend one of our monthly meetings to come and find out. And I think that you would hear answers there that you would probably not hear today from the three of us. But anybody who has been involved in birth parenting, adoption, reunion, et cetera, would be more than willing to um, sit down with you and talk with you and in a, in, a, in, in a hopefully positive way that it would make this subject not be so confusing and so worrisome to many people. Those of us who have now um, been through it and lived with it and have come out the other end, um, you can't imagine what it's done for us. And hopefully, knowing all the adoptees that I know right now and knowing my daughter, it's like, it's like the sky opened and something happened. I, th I think you owe it to yourself to explore and ask the questions and literally, please come to one of our meetings. We would love to have you as a guest, truly. Senator Carlson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd, I'd like to give a, a little bit of perspective on what uh, uh, Mr. Chair was saying also on the uh, being uh, caught, being, uh, let's say, surprised. Uh, I was surprised about a year and a half ago when my daughter called me from California. And she said, Dad, what were you doing 40 41 years ago. She said, I just got my report from uh, 23andMe and it said I have a possible sister in Minnesota. And uh, uh, she did inquire on what her name was and her name was Helen. And she had DNA that uh, evidently con came close to confirming that she was my daughter's sister. And uh, I don't remember doing anything like that, but uh, <laughs> I did find out that because my dad married my mother, my dad's brother married my mom's sister, that we were double cousins, and that the grandchild from my uncle and aunt's union had the same, close enough to the same DNA as my daughter. So I was, you know, I was comfortable that I was not guilty of anything, but it is a surprise. 
and you do get surprises. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Lewis. Uh, you know, I, I heard there's a rumor that uh, Senator Latz will buy pizza if we go past 6 o'clock. So. <laughs> if it's because of you, you're buying the pizza. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to, uh, Senator Limmer, your question. There is a public uh, awareness campaign that is part of this bill. And so that would be part of trying to get the word out that this law has changed. And Senator Latz, uh, you know, one of the most devastating things that happens to adoptees with DNA is they find out that they're adopted. Um, because the, the birth certificate that you get is an amended. Uh, you have no idea that, you're, that these are um, not your birth parents because that's how it's listed. And so that's one reason why it's necessary to be able to get an original birth certificate so you understand whether you're adopted or not for those parents who don't tell their kids that, so. All right. One last. Very briefly. <laughs> Madam Chair, and everyone Ms. deserves Needham. to have their own original government document that says who they are, where they came from, and who their parents are. Absolutely. Everyone, mm -hmm. including you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you for sharing your stories. We really appreciate you being here. Um, and thank you, committee members, for the uh, great discussion. With that, Senator Carlson moves that Senate File 1279, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right. Um, the motion is adopted. My, my uncle. We're to Senate File 1351, Senator Pappas. Yeah. What do they call it in baseball? The guy that comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what are our, our chairs here? Can you push them? Senator Pappas, Senate File 1351. This is the first committee stop. There is an author's amendment, which is a delete everything, the A2 amendment. Senator Pappas moves adoption of the A2 as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. To the now amended Senate File 1351, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pretty spacey after all day here. So <laughs> I hope the commissioner is doing better than I am. <laughs> uh, the bill before you is Senate File 1351, a bill to create an indeterminate sentence release board at the Department of Corrections to make decisions on parole. Minnesota is one of only four states where a single person makes these decisions, the Commissioner of Corrections. This current process makes parole decisions too closely tied to who is in office at a given time and circumvent best correctional practices. Uh, there is a fiscal note for this bill of $40,000 each fiscal year, and it's also included in the governor's proposed budget for corrections. Today we have with us Commissioner Paul Schnell from the Department of Corrections to testify in support of this bill. Commissioner Schnell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Paul Schnell, Commissioner. I want to start uh, by giving you a little bit of background on the current system for determining parole for individuals sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. Minnesota is a determinant sentencing uh, state. However, those sentenced to life with the possibility of parole must appear before the Commissioner of Corrections for a life sentence review hearing generally beginning about three years prior to the minimum term of confinement. When the court sentences someone to life, they have two options, life without the possibility of parole or life with the possibility of parole. For those being sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, the law is clear that they must serve that mandatory minimum term of 30 years currently and then have the opportunity to be reviewed under a process and criteria codified in statute and in rule. Currently, Minnesota has about 600 people in Minnesota correctional facilities that uh, have sentences of life with the possibility of parole. Minnesota, uh, as uh, mentioned, is one of only four states that a single person makes the parole decision. There are many safeguards in place in our law and in administrative rules 
that require careful review before release decisions are made uh, and uh, a full um, uh, assessment of risk, uh, institutional adjustment, and uh, victim input is considered prior to uh, a parole decision. Uh, these uh, decisions um, have to be made as a requirement of statute. However, the current structure makes it challenging to ensure consistency and objectivity uh, in parole decision making. There are significant and have been significant differences in commissioner approaches to and the interpretation of the law governing life sentences for parole decisions. To illustrate these differences and challenges, we analyze data that speaks to the variation that exists across decision makers. Over a 20-year period, three commissioners reviewed roughly the same number of individuals uh, who are up for parole, but granted them at far different rates. 8%, 12%, and 32%. One commissioner was responsible for almost two-thirds of the life uh, sentence individuals being granted parole. This is not an indictment of past administration, but instead highlights the challenges present in making these difficult decisions. Senate File 1351 uh, establishes this Interdeterminate Sentence Review, Review Board made up a panel of five uh, qualified individuals for which would be appointed by the governor after uh, recommend, two recommendations each are made by the majority and minority leaders of the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, with the Commissioner of Corrections then serving as the fifth member and chair. The bill simply expands um, who conducts the reviews and makes those release decisions. It does not term, uh, make any changes to who is eligible for re review um, and possible release. This bill creates a panel of experts with the right qualifications selected by leadership of the legislative branch and the governor to, to do exactly what is the responsibility of the commissioner today. Shared and trans transparent decision making uh, is difficult and yet we believe this approach um, should be uh, reflect a fair and balanced approach. A panel approach to decision making will reduce bias, increase diversity and in perspective, and strengthen understanding of correctional policy and practice <coughs> resulting in that fair, uh, more fair and equitable process. Uh, with that, I thank you for your time and consideration and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Members, I'm not aware of any other people that have signed up to testify in connection with this bill, so we'll open it up now for committee discussion. Any questions or conversations from the committee? Senator Kroon, then Senator Lemur. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the intermediate part and the way this is structured, I don't seem to have an issue with. Um, I guess my concern comes down to, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, we're changing it to a majority vote. Do, do I have that right uh, on the pardons board? Commissioner Snell. Mr. Chair, Senator Cruin, yes, this would be a majority vote. 305 would be required. <coughs> and, and current, Senator Cruin. And currently, thank you, Mr. Chair, and currently it's uh, unanimous. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, currently it's just up Senator to the commissioner Bales. by himself. Senator Lemmer. Thank you. Uh, are the members on the uh, board, uh, are they paid? Is, there, is this a salaried position or a volunteer? Or per diem? Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, they are uh, compensated uh, at, a, at, a, at a rate. Uh, you can see that the uh, it is, I think, listed right now at $55 per day. Um, to be involved in these parole hearings. We should raise that. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Lemmer. I know the author, uh, or Senator Pappas, you said in your opening comment that this would um, 
uh, not make it as a political target or something to that effect uh, by changing it from one member of the administration to uh, a panel. Uh, but Mr. I, Chairman, I didn't say anything. Uh, Senator I, I thought I heard something to the effect that we're trying to avoid a political identity. No. Um, I'll withdraw the question that I miss, misheard you then. Or did the commissioner say that? No? Okay. Is there any further discussion or are there any further questions from the committee? Um. Senator Limmer. Uh, Commissioner or Senator Pappas, could you tell me uh, how many states do not have, uh, I, I would call this a parole board, but, uh, but you're limiting it to specific uh, sentences. But nevertheless, uh, are, do we have any other states in the country that are like our present system? Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Um, Minnesota is one of only four states where a single person makes these decisions. Usually there is some kind of a board All right. that makes them. Right. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Limmer, I think um, uh, your comments about politicizing, uh, yeah, I think that maybe that could happen with just one commissioner making all the decisions and you know one perspective on this instead of having a broader perspective. And I think when, when the commissioner talked about past commissioners had different rates, at which they did provide releases, um, it may have been, you know, the winds of the time or how strict we want to be about crime or criminals that could have influenced that commissioner. I don't really know. I mean, I'm kind of guessing. So I do think having kind of a broader group of people who have criminal justice background and experience and then, you know, the involvement of the legislature I think would also help so that you have people that, you know, the majority leader and the minority leader actually recommended to the governor. Um, so it becomes more bipartisan and that we're kind of in this together. It's not just the political party that's in charge. So I think it might depoliticize it. Any further discussion? Senator Pappas moves that Senate file 1351 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the state government committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, since there's Senator a fiscal Pappas. note for $40,000, then what happens with that? We go to finance or do we come back here to be considered by your committee? It's a question anyway to think about. So, Senator Pappas, it's included in the governor's budget right now, um, but we don't have targets yet, and uh, I think it's identified in this committee's budget in the governor's budget, but I'm not sure any of that is final. So, probably have to make some determinations somewhere down the road as to who's going to carry the funding for it. Right. So, that would be my question, Mr. Chairman, after state and government, if I should go to finance or if I should come back here. Not sure yet. Okay. Great. All right, members, final bill of the evening, Senate File 2734. Senator Latz. Madam Chair uh, and members, Senate File 2734 is a GPS tracking device. Uh, some of you may recall last year um, when we had a, a very lengthy conversation in committee about the ability of law enforcement to use a device that they can literally discharge from their own car, like shoot it from their own squad car onto another vehicle, and then uh, 
the other vehicle can be tracked using GPS uh, coordinates so that the law enforcement officer uh, does not need to chase them or be present if an unoccupied vehicle uh, becomes occupied and takes off. Uh, so we had a lot of conversation about this and there was a lot of discussion at the time about how this fits into the statutes, how does it fit into just a Fourth Amendment standard analysis with exigent circumstances, because this statute does provide for a separate process to get a special court order to be able to attach one of these devices to a vehicle. Um, the upshot was that there was no final decision made in the in, at the end of the last legislative session about how to approach this. <clears throat> um, since that time, uh, there have been additional conversations and language has been modified and refined. And while in my judgment it, it still uh, contains the, affirmative, the infirmity of not being, uh, I think, consistent with standard Fourth Amendment analysis, uh, it is my judgment that for now, for the limited purposes provided in this bill, the viable path forward for providing this tool to law enforcement is through the separate statutory process of getting a court order to use this kind of a device and then limiting the use of a mobile tracking device to those cases where it's a stolen motor vehicle when the owner of the vehicle that was stolen has consented to using this kind of a tracking device to try to locate their vehicle. Um, and the owner of the vehicle has reported that to law enforcement that the vehicle was stolen and the vehicle is occupied when the tracking device is installed. Uh, so very strict limitations on this. Um, the idea being at that point that rather than trying to stop a vehicle which is believed to have been stolen and is occupied, presumably by a driver, that the tracking device can be attached to it remotely, rather than the law enforcement officer trying to initiate a traffic stop and instead provoking a high-speed chase. Um, there are additional restrictions placed around this uh, in that um, <clears throat> the uh, device must be removed within 24 hours. Um, they must obtain a separate search warrant, granting approval to continue to use the device in the investigation if, if they wish to leave it on for more than 24 hours. Um, that uh, once the vehicle is recovered, the tracking device must be removed and any tracking device evidence collected after the motor vehicle is returned to the owner is not admissible in any legal proceeding. Uh, I will be moving the author's amendment A1, which also provides for some data gathering uh, so that the BCA and we can get better information on its use and how effective it might be. Somewhere down the road, I anticipate that we'll have some decisions to make about whether to expand the circumstances under which this might be used, such as if a law enforcement officer comes across a vehicle that's going 70 miles an hour in a 65 zone, attempts to stop the vehicle while moving, and the vehicle takes off, can they attach a GPS tracking device at that time and back off on a chase? Um, not because the vehicle may have been stolen, but because the occupant of the vehicle who may own the vehicle may not want to be stopped by law enforcement for whatever reason. Um, but I, I think we, uh, in order to make progress on this front, um, I'm comfortable moving forward with the, the narrowly conscribed terms that are set forth in this bill. So, Madam Chair, I, I'd like to offer the A1 as an author's mm -hmm. amendment. Senator Latz offers the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 The opposed? Okay, the amendment's adopted. Uh, That's all I Rich have, Madam Chair. 
<laughs> Thank you, Senator Lutz. I know Rich Neumeister has been waiting to testify all day. Come forward. S state your name and title for the record. You may begin. Madam Chair, my name is Rich Neumeister. I have waited many years on many committees, like the old subcommittee on privacy that used to go till 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, as it was referred to. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, what this bill does is the intersection of technology and law enforcement. Facial recognition, stingrays that track down cell phones are many of the kinds of things that you've talked about here or will be talking about, license plate readers, on and on. So this was one of those situations where a Batman type dart would go out, hit a thing, hit the car, and then you'd follow it with a like James Bond thing or whatever it might be. Uh, and it brought privacy issues there. The issue is like if your car is stolen and the police notice and it's on a private property, can they put a, just walk up and put a device on it? Those were some of the questions that almost a two-hour discussion in this committee last year uh, dealt with. So this was a lot of language that came from that lot of discussion and everybody, GOP, DFL, House members, ACLU, and myself, and even law enforcement. This is what was agreed upon. And yes, there are philosophical differences about what or whatever, as, as the Senator, as Madam Chair, Senator Lance mentioned. Secondly, so I wish to say thank you to all those folks that were all part of that discussion. And third, <clears throat> Madam Chair, and I just share this with you. What you are amending is a 35-year-old statute that case law has developed on privacy rights, that new technology has happened, and no one has really taken the time to let's modernize. And one of the things that came out of the debate last year, and as Senator Lance and Senator Lemmer will remember, was our statutes need to be updated for you as legislators, we the public, and the, and the officials who use it for privacy of communication. That includes wiretaps. So I invite someone, if you're interested, uh, any of you to do that. I, that's one of my, I, there are three things before I drop the bucket, or bucket list that I like to do before I die or leave this place. One of them is to update 626A. So Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm very much obliged to you for your time, and uh, this is a, a good bill, and I thank you for the reporting addition to Thank you, Mr. Neumeister. I think we should get you some <laughs> more fun things to put on your bucket list. <laughs> well, well, I'm talking about, you know, here. <laughs> but thank you for being here, members. <sighs> All right, Senator Latz. Where does this go? Ms. Kaplan. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that Senate file number 2734 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. Thank you for the motion, Senator Lutz. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion's adopted. And with that, we are adjourned. Before everyone leaves, I, I would like to thank all of you for the long day, for the, uh, the hard work, for the very interesting and productive conversations. Um, we have one week left until the second deadline. We're going to have a, a busy week next week. Um, we're going to try to fit in every bill that we can that gets referred to us. Not every other committee has finished their work, and some of the bills they are, haven't sent to us are going to be of, of some discussion. Uh, we're going to do our best. Uh, have a good weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Latz. Now we're officially adjourned. Thank you.